William M. Johnson Lecture Series for 2021. Uh, my name is Bill Thomason, and I'm for the past 10 years, I've been um, chair of the committee that have, have planned the uh, lectures. Uh, the purpose of the Johnson Lectures uh, was to address the spiritual, intellectual, ethical, and social issues confronting us as a Christian community. And in order to fulfill that purpose, um, the past few years we've had uh, for our lectures, people including uh, Dr. Paul Duke, who was a uh, one-time pastor of Highland Baptist Church here in Louisville, and is now co-pastor with his wife, Stacy in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Gary Dorian, the Reinhold Niebuhr uh, Professor of Social Ethics at Union Seminary, and a recent uh, recipient of the Grawmeyer Award. Um, Dr. Amy Powell, who teaches doctrinal theology at uh, Louisville Presbyterian Seminary. Wendell Berry, who needs no introduction at all. Uh, Dr. David Gushy, who teaches social ethics at um, uh, Mercer University and is also head of the social ethics department at the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Brent Walker, who was the um, longtime uh, executive of the Joint Baptist Committee on Public Affairs in Washington, D.C. Um, and in 2019, which was our, the last year we had a lecture, we did a um, series of lectures in honor of Glenn Henson, uh, a long weekend in which six of his former colleagues and students uh, came and spoke um, to, um, uh, to honor him. Uh, next year, we're planning on honoring John R. Claypool, who was uh, the senior minister here in the 1960s and early 70s and had a tremendous influence on many, many seminary students. Um, our lecturers this year continue this uh, long tradition of excellence. The lectures um, are named in honor of William M. Johnson, um, who came to Crescent Hill Baptist Church in 1982 as our Minister of Education. Uh, and in the almost uh, 40 years that he has uh, been with us, he's worn about every hat uh, that you can wear as a minister uh, in a church. Um, he has profoundly influenced our intellectual and spiritual lives uh, in the way that he has ministered to us through teaching, preaching, and spiritual direction. Um, we could not have designated uh, this series in a more appropriate way than by uh, naming it for Bill. We're honored to have Bill with us today, and he is going to introduce our lectures uh, and our speakers. Bill. I'm immensely pleased that our lecture series this year gives attention to the life and legacy of Diana Richmond Garland. Diana was a shining star among us. She was a steady point of light to so many in so many ways. Each of us is all the better for having known and loved her. Diana was my friend and beloved colleague in ministry for many years. And I carry her in my memory with deep admiration and gratitude. A comprehensive profile of Diana's life and work has been compiled and written by T. Lane Scales and Helen Harris, and I commend it to you for your attention. For my contribution today, I want to share a few memories of Diana's life uh, with me, and I hope that my memories of her will touch your memories of her, and we can lift them up to God by a glad thanksgiving for who she was. It's been said that gratitude is the memory of the heart. And when I think of Diana, that is so fitting for this day. I have five memories that I want to share with you. And I think I'm going to try to do that by heart through my head, um, just to give some other glimpses of who she was. One of my early memories of Diana was in the mid 80s. Uh, she approached me about being part of a prayer group that she was convening that would meet one day a week during the fall semester. Academicians always deal with the academic calendar. 
So we agreed to that. I was taken by her invitation to invite me. So taken, I think, that I couldn't say no. And so we set a time to meet each week. We would meet in her office in Norton Hall. She made it clear that when we entered the room, we were to leave our accolades and our titles and our accomplishments at the door. And we will be a group of beggars that were seeking to know God better, ourselves better, and each other better. And we sought to do that for 13 weeks. One of the things that I remember from that time, and it was my, one of my earliest memories of Diana, was how much she was influenced by Micah 6.8. And I think it's very fitting today that what, both what John and Sarah speak is to those, uh, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. I also was taken by how much she was influenced by Matthew 20, 31 and following. I guess that's just who, what a social thing in those terms, the least of these. And uh, that is my early memory of Diana. My saying yes to her was one of my better yeses. And I treasure that our friendship actually started in those moments and it continued until she moved to Waco. A second memory I have of Diana was her being a part of Crescent Hill Baptist Church. She was a member 17 years from 1980 to 1997. Her children began that pilgrimage in this church. She loved Crescent Hill Baptist Church. She was a member of the Hesed Sunday School class that was taught by the beloved Betty uh, Cook. Uh, it was a remarkable collection of young women. I always think that the name of a Sunday School class is important. And one of the classes I taught here in name was the Barnabas class. In the Hesed class, Hesed means the steadfast love of God. And so many of the members of that class lived into that, reflecting the steadfast love of God. Betty Cook was a prime example of that, wasn't she? Um, in the course of Diana being here, she was elected a deacon one year. And at that time, deacon served for three years. She chose to uh, chair the Christian Education Committee at my strong prompting. And uh, she did that the first year as elect in the next years as chair of the Christian Education Committee. It was a delight and joy to work with her, and we accomplished much under those three years. One of the things she had a question about and qualm about was how the education staff was evaluated. And I'm going to put it simply in these terms. The first year that she was chair-elect, I went to my evaluation by myself. That's a long walk down a long hall. The second and third year, she went with me. To walk with Diana Garland down the hall to your evaluation uh, changed the whole complexion of that. She didn't make some changes in that without being upfront and open with everyone. But what she did changed the whole complexion of our evaluation. And I will always be grateful to her for that. The third memory I have of Diana was one, one uh, season when she was very ill and she was at a hospital downtown. Her illness carried her over, over the weekend and so she was hospitalized through the weekend. And one of the things that I've learned in ministry is uh, Sunday evening can be a very lonely time. I think that's probably why we had have the divorce recovery workshops and the meetings on Sunday night. And it's very lonely in a hospital. So I made my way downtown to go see her, um, tentatively walked down the hall, I, with timidity, knocked on her door, which was a jar. I didn't know what to expect, but that was that bright reply, come in. I walked in and here was the scene. The bed was at 90 degrees. Uh, she was sitting there. Her food tray was loaded with heavy books and she was furiously writing. And I said, Diana, what are you doing? You're supposed to be sick. And she said, well, I am sick, but I got all these uh, book reports and reviews I've got to do. And uh, we had a wonderful visit. As I left, I was so taken by always a scholar. She was always a scholar. 
about eight months later, when I received my review in Exposta, which was the uh, scholarly journal from Southern Seminary, I flipped to the back. And if you remember in the back were all the book reviews. And so I made my way to the section uh, with spiritual formation, which was my interest and social work. And there they were, these heavy, heady books being reviewed by Diana Garland and page after page at the bottom, Diana S. Richmond Garland. I saw those things when they were being formed, but I never forgot this, what a scholar she was. The fourth memory is a paradoxical memory. It happened in the, one of the worst weeks of her life. It was the week she was dismissed as Dean of the uh, Carver School of Social Work. I think that happened early in the week and Wednesday night as always, we had our fellowship meal and uh, activities for the children and youth and we had prayer meeting. We received word that Diana and David were coming for the meal. Uh, I was stunned by that, but we made uh, preparations for that coming. And we simply said to our folk, when Diana and David walk in the fellowship hall, will you acknowledge that presence? So we waited and as was usual, they were running late. We served from five to six and it was about five minutes to six. To this day, I can still see them walking down the hall. They were going at each other about who had money to pay for the meal. And then they turned the corner and walked into Fellowship Hall. Now, if you ever been to a Fellowship Mill in Fellowship Hall on Wednesday night, you know it's noisy. And then a moment's notice, the room grew quiet. And then somebody began to clap. And other people began to clap. And then the clapping slowed down because people were getting up to clap. Baptists can't clap and stand at the same time. So, but the clapping continued. Now I've been around church all my life and I've been a minister for over 50 years. But for me, that was one of the most highest moments of church that I've ever experienced. Mystics talk about those thin places in life, which I think are those times when heaven and earth seem close together. And that's what happened that night. The clapping continued and continued and continued. I think Diana for the first time that week was able to exhale. And she was surrounded by the love and care and appreciation of her church family. I will never ever forget that. And my hope was that she would never forget that too. In the midst of so much darkness and hurt, there was a moment when the Holy came among us and we were made all the better in our sadness and sorrow. The last memory I have is 2006. The Garlands moved to Fort Worth, I think, I mean, to Waco, I think in um, 97, 1997. We invited uh, Diana back to lead a children's conference. And um, she immediately said, yes. It made me think about my reluctant yes to her when she asked me about being a part of the prayer group. She was delighted that we invited her and we worked towards what we would do with the conference. As we got closer to that, uh, I called Diana and said, now Diana, we're gonna have to, we wanna have a nice place for you to stay. And she said, oh no, I've already got places where I'm staying. Everybody's asking me to stay with them. I said, okay. And then I said, well, we want to do some hospitality about meals and things. Oh, no, no, that's already taken care of. Well, we want to send somebody to the airport to pick you up. No, no, that's already taken care of. I think I finally said, okay, Diana, here's the deal. At 8.45 on Saturday morning, you are to be in Fellowship Hall. At 10.45 on Sunday, you are to be in the sanctuary because you are preaching. Uh, it is Children's Sabbath, and we want you there. She said, okay. She came, it was a wonderful weekend. We saw Diana at her best. She was at the top of her game. Beyond the conference she led here, it was a trip to Bountiful for her in coming to see those that she had left when she went to Waco. Um, I think again, God took that moment and turned it into something divine. 
I thought about uh, back when she invited me to that, uh, those sessions on prayer. And over these last days and thinking about the memories I would share, I kept thinking about a wonderful line that Mary Oliver offered. Late in her life, they were asking her about prayer. Uh, she was private enough that she wouldn't really go into that. But she did say, uh, at this point in my life, I find myself saying thank you a lot. And over these last weeks and thinking about Diana Garland, I too have said thank you. Um, I will have some closing words and then I'll, I'll introduce Sarah. Interestingly, um, what we put in our Bibles, what we carry in our Bibles that we add I think uh, says something about what we value. And I noticed about a year ago that I was carrying the brochure of the conference that uh, Diana led for us in 2006. Um, it's found a special place in my Bible as well as my heart. I wanna say some concluding words about her vocation as a dean. Put succinctly, Diana Garland served two Baptist seminaries, uh, two Baptist institutions, Southern Seminary and Baylor University. These were two top institutions at her time there. And in, and in those two, op, two uh, institutions, she offered to them top schools of social work. And in the divine providence of God, Diana lived to see the School of Social Work at Baylor receive her name. That's a blessing I use that ask us, ask God to grant us the wisdom to know that the world now is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. And so we pray that God will take our lives and speak truth through them and that God will abide in our hearts and breathe love with them. And I can think of no one who better did that than Diana Richmond Garland. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I have the privilege uh, to introduce Sarah Gollum. Um, it's a nice, smooth uh, segue from talking about Diana to talk about Sarah. Uh, she carries her mother in her in so many ways, not only in her gifts and abilities, but in her appearances and in her mannerisms. In her own right, Sarah is an accomplished journalist. Since, 19, since 2010, she has served as the executive director of the Hessinger Report, which is, has awesome responsibilities as she connects with many other news outlets in New York. She's written two books and many articles for publication, including the New York Times and Newsweek. She holds a master's degree in journalism and Latin American studies from New York University. She lives in New York with her husband, Matt, and her two children, her daughter, Tess, and her son, Matthew. It is very fitting today that Sarah Garland will talk to us about doing justice. Sarah, we welcome you, welcome home, and we will hear you gladly. Thank you, Bill. Um, I knew it would be hard to go after Bill, <laughs> so give me a minute. Um, Thank you so much to Bill and to Bill Thomason, and thank you to Eileen uh, for setting it up. And thank you so much to the Crescent Hill community for hosting this lecture in honor of my mom. It means so much to our family to be remembered by our home church. And I so wish I could be there in person to say that with a hug. Um, before I get started, I wanted to let everyone know that I'll be talking about clergy sexual abuse. And I wanted to pause for a minute in case there's anyone for whom that content might be upsetting or disturbing uh, to give you to, um, a chance to step out for this talk and come back for my brother's lecture. When my family left Louisville 24 years ago, my parents were devastated. They were shattered at having to say goodbye to colleagues who'd become friends and friends who'd become family over the course of a quarter century in Louisville. They were hurt and of course pretty mad at the fundamentalists who'd taken over Southern Seminary and who forced out my mom and so many of their colleagues. I was just plain furious. I was mad at the seminary and the Baptist leadership 
I was mad at religion and the way people treat each other in its name. And I was mad at God. I was mad at my parents too. I couldn't believe that the best option was Waco, Texas. This was well before Fixer Upper glossed it over back when it was just known as a dusty hub for cowboys and Branch Davidians. And I, I didn't realize just how traumatic the experience was for my parents until much later. I stayed angry for a long time and I didn't set foot in a church for years. Instead, I headed to New York City to become a journalist, far from my roots, intent on finding my own way to do justice in a messed up world. When there is so much injustice and division, fear and anxiety, we wanna do something. It has been infuriating to watch multiple crises tear apart my hometown, to see the streets of Louisville still reeling from gun violence and the wounds of racist violence, and to wonder why we can't finally do something to fix it. It is heartbreaking that I can't be with you guys this weekend, that instead during this pandemic that we should be fighting together, we are fighting about masks and science. It makes us wanna do something to change people's minds. It has been scary to send my children to school every day, unvaccinated as the virus keeps spreading, wishing I could do something to keep all our kids safe. There's not a lot required of us, the Bible says, but one of them is to do justice. But how do we do justice? And remembering my mother, like Bill said, thinking back on a woman who is always doing and doing, I feel both inspired and daunted. It feels like we need to do this justice thing, but how? My parents came to Louisville in the 1970s. My dad got his doctorate from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and my mom went to the University of Louisville to earn her social work PhD. They both joined the faculty at Southern. My mom started first teaching a course there for Ann Davis, the Dean of the Carver Social Work School. And my dad joined the faculty later after finishing his D-Men and his PhD. When we were little kids, my brother and I spent hours every week at Southern Seminary. We went to daycare there. And then when we attended Courage Taylor Elementary School downtown, the school bus would drop us off so we could spend the afternoon in our parents' offices. We sat on the floor while they worked or just roamed the halls, peeking in on the other professors to say hi. I remember running through the Josephus Bowl, balancing on the stone walls and barreling down the big hill. Later, I learned to drive there, trying to let out the clutch just right in our old Volvo so it wouldn't slip back down the hills. I've been thinking a lot about those times. Whenever my kids pop into the background of my Zoom calls, I try to remember the patients and even the joy of those seminary grownups who didn't blink an eye when we colored and played at their feet while they held important meetings. How do we do justice when our world and our lives feel just safe enough? My mom became the Dean of the social work there in 1993. The same year, a new conservative president was chosen for the seminary. Within a few years, he and the trustees began to reshape the seminary that had been our second home. Lane Scales, a professor of social work at Baylor now and a graduate of Southern has written an excellent history of the Carver School and I pulled a lot of the details uh, from her book to supplement my hazy teenage memories. Not long after he started, the new president began to push out longtime faculty and the social work school's only black professor was prevented from getting tenure. When my mom tried to hire a replacement, the president required the new candidate to explain his views on homosexuality, abortion and women in the ministry. The candidate, David Sherwood, said he would supported the ordination of women. The president responded by telling my mom she needed to find someone else. She said she would resign because there were no other qualified social work faculty who could meet that criterion. At first, my mom and the president tried to negotiate, but in the end, she said he said she couldn't hire anyone who believed women could serve as ministers. It was Monday in 1995. My mom called a lawyer, the social work students, and a group of reporters for a meeting where she read verses from 2 Corinthians and Micah. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. She then met with the president who demanded her resignation. 
fine, she said. And this is so my mom, she slammed the door on the way out. By the end of the day, she'd been fired from her position as Dean for insubordination. How do we do justice when the systems and the power structures are against us? We didn't leave Louisville for another two years. My dad stayed on at the seminary while my mom took a new job as a professor at another religious institution there. In 1997, my dad was hired as a professor at Baylor University in Waco. And from Waco, my mom continued to be employed by the institution back in Louisville until she was also hired on faculty at Baylor. She jumped into the warm and open-minded and intellectually ambitious space she found in the social work department at Baylor. She started the graduate program there and within a couple of years, the department had become a full school at the university. She also launched a new line of research on clergy sexual abuse against women. When I was about 25, she told me why. She had been a victim of clergy sexual abuse herself. At the job she'd taken after she left Southern, a man had abused his position of power over her. The perpetrator was not only her boss, but someone she turned to for spiritual support during the most traumatic time in her life. He abused that trust and he abused her. He threatened her current job and he threatened to sabotage her future employment if she revealed what had happened. She learned later that he was a predator who had abused and was grooming other women. On top of the loss of her job, her beloved social work school and her community, the trauma and the guilt that accompanied the abuse were overwhelming. When she told me about it, she explained that my parents were working through it. My dad had forgiven her and he was supporting her as she went through counseling and worked on forgiving herself. But it was devastating. Their lives and our family would never be the same. And yet out of that broken place, my mom found a new calling. How do we do justice when we ourselves are the victims? This was in the early 2000s, just after the Boston Globe and others had begun revealing the Catholic Church's deep and disturbing legacy of child sexual abuse by Catholic priests. The crisis in the Catholic Church had brought attention to an issue that was just being recognized as a problem among adults too. Still, often sexual relationships between clergy and adult congregants were seen as affairs rather than abuse that traumatized its victims. In a paper in 2006 titled, When Wolves Wear Shepherd's Clothing, my mom wrote about how damaging the confusion had been to victims and to congregations. Such a relationship, she wrote, is not merely adultery, although it may include adultery. The religious leader disregards the damaging results of the relationship for the one over whom he has power. Because of his power, he can manipulate the victim, not only psychologically, but also morally, inducing spiritual confusion and guilt the crisis becomes a crisis of faith, exploiting the religious faith of the other and the sacred trust in his ministerial leadership in order to gain sexual pleasure. Sometimes the, clerg sometimes the terms clergy sexual misconduct and clergy sexual abuse are used interchangeably, she went on. But misconduct does not capture the exploitation, the betrayal of trust and destruction his behavior causes, often driving the woman her family and others from the church, from faith and from one another. Divorce and suicide are common. How do we do justice when our minds are twisted by confusing shame and hurt? My mom wrote that one victim had described the experience as soul rape. The trauma she wrote rips through her defenses so she cannot react effectively, shattering her understanding of her herself her faith in the order of the world and in the divine, injuring her ability to feel safe and to trust. In 2009, my mom and another researcher, Mark Chavez, published the findings of the first rigorous study of the prevalence of clergy sexual abuse among adults. The vast majority of abuse cases in the US targeted women, they found. And while clergy sexual abuse was not as common as workplace ab abuse, as many as one in 30 church going women have been the target of a sexual advance by a congregational leader. 
One in 50 have been targeted by a married church leader. How do we do justice when the numbers feel too overwhelming? For the next decade, my mom published papers and gave speeches on the topic. She also listened to the stories of dozens and dozens of women, many of whom she stayed in touch with long-term. In her papers and her talks, she often spoke about the many instances of clergy sexual abuse described in the Bible, including the story of Bathsheba. David uses all the power he could muster to trap her, she would explain. He's in total control. This is not a consensual affair, it is rape. My mom's research helped to expose a problem endemic to churches and religion more broadly and to define it for what it was. Pastors often describe sexual abuse as sin, she would explain. Victims described it as evil, but her main goal was to help victims finding healing and justice. She wanted to give social workers and others who responded to victims the language to help them counsel women, tools for responding to their trauma, and guidelines for how to report abuse and find legal help. She was also clear about the role of forgiveness, which while it was important in the healing process was very complicated, and I'll leave it for another day. And anyway, forgiveness, she wrote, is no substitute for justice. Mishpat is the ancient Hebrew word we translate as justice. It is one of those guidepost words found throughout the Old Testament, guiding, comforting a terrified and hurt people in a dangerous world. It means judgment and just leadership. It also means restoration and healing. It means all will be well. Mishpat is the resurrection power, the make all things new and right power found in the presence of a God who cares about those who are hurt and abandoned. It is one of the most common words found on the lips of pleading and oppressed people in the scriptures. So how are we supposed to do mishpat? How do we do justice? How in the world do we do justice in our worst moments when everything we love, believed in, hoped for is crumbling around us? When I found out my mom was sick with pancreatic cancer, I was six months pregnant with my second baby, Matthew. He was a miracle baby we didn't think was possible. And the whole family was so happy. My mom possibly more than me and my husband, Matt. She had been heartbroken at how long it took us to have our first baby test. And she so desperately wanted a parcel of grandchildren who would come and go hiking, and play in the woods at her cabin in Colorado while she baked muffins and cookies for them. She'd spent months out there after her traumatic experience in Louisville, living in a one room hut without plumbing while workers added bedrooms for the big family she imagined would come keep her company during her retirement. At the time, I thought she was nuts living out there in the cold all alone while they added the extra rooms. This was not long after my parents moved to Waco, and I now know she went there to process the trauma, to atone for the pain it had caused, and to talk to God about how to pick herself up and keep going. My mom was a doer. She was a door slammer. But I know now more than anything, she was a listener. As a social worker and a researcher, she listened to others tell their stories, and she also listened to God. The cancer came on fast and she went back to the cabin to fend her last few, spend her last few months. She was dazed with pain a lot of the time, but at one point she told me she wanted to write a book about her experiences with cancer and the medical system and she wanted me to help edit it. How do we do justice when we have no time left? When our bodies are breaking down and our spirits are barely hanging on? Just as she had taken the trauma and anger of her experiences in Louisville and put them to work for others, she wanted to help others cope with the fear, the frustration, and the pain of a terminal cancer diagnosis. She planned to fit in the writing between chemo treatments and cleaning out the house so we wouldn't have to deal with too many boxes after she was gone. But she died not long after that conversation, four months after Matthew was born. I cried every night after she died, often while holding Matthew. 
I was only sleeping a few hours at a time. My grief was one note, fury. I was angry at her for leaving me and at God for taking her away. For months, I sat in the dark and I screamed silently at her and God, sobbing and trying not to stir my half-awake baby. My mom told me it's okay to get really, really mad and even slam doors sometimes. I could sometimes feel her raging with me in those moments at how deeply unfair it all felt. She had so much left to do. My brother preaches often on this topic, maybe because he grew up with the two of us. He says that we have to give our anger and our hate to God, that it's the only way to deal with it responsibly. We can scream and yell and say awful things to God as long as we let out the hate and trust that God will know what to do with it to help us move forward. There is so much injustice in this world, whether it's a mom cleaning up all the family clutter after working a full day and cooking dinner and then having to work some more, or bigger matters like endemic racism, sexual violence, and child poverty. My mom wasn't around to witness the horrors of the last couple of years. Racial violence, families separated at the border, climate change fueling fires and storms that are devastating whole landscapes and cities, and a virus still killing thousands of people a day. All crises that will impact vulnerable communities already ravaged by poverty and racism for years to come. There's so much to be angry about and so much fury and despair that people are taking out on each other, whether it's on social media or at supercharged school board meetings, I'm a journalist and my job is covering education. A lot of the reporters I work with have hit a breaking point. By nature or training or just experience, journalists are thick skinned people. We learn to take insults and we take a front seat whenever there's conflict. But a lot of my colleagues are instead taking social media breaks, even though Twitter is our bread and butter. The most mission driven among us are wondering if what we do even matters, if it's really worth it. Those of us from marginalized communities and those of us who are parents especially, we're just fed up. We're exhausted and increasingly furious that our work to bring the truth to the public is either ignored or worse, vilified. And I know a lot of nurses and doctors and teachers and social workers and others working on the front lines fielding crisis after crisis feel the same way. But now imagine a new question. Instead of asking, how do I do justice? Imagine asking, how do I participate in justice? Or how do I carry justice? Which my brother tells me is a good Hebrew translation of Micah 6, 8. Put another way, how do I seek justice? My mom wasn't here these last couple of years, but I'm pretty sure I know how she would have reacted. Her last book, Why I Am a Social Worker, was published the year she died, 2015. In it, she explored what it means to find God's calling for you in the world, whether that's through your job or by other means. As with a lot of her work on clergy sexual abuse, her research was focused on listening. Over several years, she and her co-authors interviewed social workers about what had brought them to the field and what sustained them when it get, gets hard, because social work always gets hard. She tied together the disparate experiences of the social workers she interviewed, noting they often didn't disagree. They often uh, disagreed and she didn't agree with them. But there was a common thread she believed and her conclusion feels all the more relevant now. In the last pages of the book, she wrote, Christian hope is not a feeling, it is a decision. The decision for hope rests on what we believe at the deepest levels what our most basic convictions are about the world and about God and about the future. We choose hope, not as a naive wish, but as a choice with our eyes wide open to the reality of the world and our responsibility to be at work in it. Sometimes we feel discouraged or even despairing. We may feel doubt, even of the principles of the faith we have chosen to believe most fervently. The hope comes from God. We just need to open ourselves to receiving it and then pass it on, whether we feel it or not, to others. She went on, 
God wants us to seek justice. Ours is to work toward justice in everything we do, but recognize with humility that it is not ours to create. We seek justice, we do not create it, she wrote. Hope and faith cannot whisk us out of brutal reality, but at the same time, hopelessness can paralyze us into not acting at all. Our comfort as Christians comes in knowing that we are not able to change hard realities, but God can. Our job is simply to sow the seeds of hope and to pick up the hand of another and read hope in it. My mom ended the book with this prayer, which she often prayed at social work school graduations. So I'll conclude with it now. We are grateful, Lord God, that when you call us on this journey, you don't call us to walk it alone. We thank you for one another to share the journey, to comfort and encourage one another. Lord, hold our hands and steady us on the way. Don't let us trip over challenges seen and unseen, but if we do trip, pick us up and set us back on the path. Show us just the next three steps to take or even just one. We don't need to see all the way for we trust the destination to you. Give us courage to go step by step with one another and with you. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. That was a very moving. Um, what you said, and I think all of us are trying to process the uh, uh, feelings that we're having now. If you have any questions, um, I don't think we have any in the chat room. Um, but if you uh, have some questions, you can uh, raise your hand or use the. Um, uh, reactions uh, button on your computer, and uh, we'll uh, direct those to uh, Sarah. So, any any questions? Any comments? I was uh, late getting on. I apologize. I'm. Kay Sanders and um, uh, your mom was one of my social work teachers uh, many years ago. <clears throat> but um, I, what I did hear of you, I thought was or from you, I thought was fabulous, and I appreciate your sharing. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> Sarah, I'm curious if you have any um, books in, in line. I, I just finished your uh, first book about gangs in Garden City uh, yesterday, actually, and uh, I'd read uh, your book about Louisville desegregation several months ago. Um, I just wondered if you had something else that you're working on now. In a word, no. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a long couple of years. So mm -hmm. unlike my mother, I'm not going to be writing a book on the side. Um, <laughs> no, I love editing the work of others. That is my, my joy these days is working with other reporters um, and helping to shape um, stories that, that um, others are out reporting in the world. Um, Maybe someday. <laughs> well, you're a very good writer, and I would urge you uh, not to hide that uh, candle under a bushel. So thank you. To quote the Bible. Uh, <laughs> OK, Alice. I'm mute here. Well, Sarah, I would be curious to see how uh, some of the racial unrest of the past year and a half was how you view that now in light of the book you wrote earlier about the school desegregation in, in Louisville and the busing issues. Do you see any correlations, connections? Um, how does that inform the way you look at things now? Um, just whatever reflections you might have on, on those two. Thank you, Alice. Um, 
That's such a hard question. I did, you know, after um, Brianna Taylor's death last summer, I did an interview with um, someone in the um, in the JCPS, and I can't remember his exact role right now, so forgive me. But um, but we'd both gone to Atherton, um, and he'd been bused to Atherton. Um, and so we talked about the experience of busing and where we were or where Louisville was as a community now, um, a place that had in, in theory tried really hard to um, deal with the racial rifts in history and had done so, such a bad job. Um, and, and it was a really interesting conversation. I think both of us talked about sort of how, and this is something I dealt with in the book and I think is still very real that that desegregating the schools wasn't enough. It was maybe, it was important, but it certainly wasn't enough to deal with, you know, a legacy of racism that extends to where people live and are allowed to live and how the police treat people and, and who's allowed to have power in the city. Um, so, I mean, I think if anything, it just underlined, you know, some of the things that I, the, the fact that, that things are just still so bad, um, you know, and with the, the violence this week as well, I think it just, schools can't do it all. And yet we need to embrace schools as a place where we can at least start and, and start the change, but it's not enough. I just want to say thank you for writing that book. I think it was one of the first books that I read that made me see things in a little bit different light that maybe those of us who have white skin and white privilege might not be seeing things as clearly as from another perspective from the community to which everything's actually happening. And that really started my journey and looking at things differently. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Alice, that means a lot. Kelly Wogan has uh, placed a question in the uh, chat box um, to follow up on Alice's question, uh, what does seeking racial justice look like for us, the church today? Hmm. Well, so here's where I'm not the expert. <laughs> I'm going to throw that one to John, <laughs> who I think could talk a lot about that. And that's what he does in his church. And that's really what their church is seems to be i'm i'm now a pseudo member of john's church so i spend a lot of that time there on facebook um so john i don't know if you want to address that because i know you're doing a lot of work yeah the, the short answer is you uh, we have to constantly be anti-racist um, we're having uh, constantly asking that question what are we doing right now that is anti-racist not just um uh and it, not just the, the racial justice is, is a part participating in that walking against the conveyor belt um, mentality. Sarah, I have a question for you because uh, I'm looking uh, I'm looking across this. I'm going to ask the question room. first, but you can go. <laughs> then I'll but I just I'm looking across this room and we're seeing like some of mom's best friends ever. Uh, and like some of the people who like took care of us when we were babies. Um, and you and I, I think we both had this image of mom being like this super strong, independent woman um, who could do it alone and like still work in the hospital bed and whatnot. But she always had good friends, like really, really good friends. Um, and when we moved to Waco, she never had friends again. Uh, they, she never made friends in Waco. They were completely isolated there by professional mentality. So I'm just wondering, like you always saw things better than I did because I was like such a goofball kid. But how did you see uh, mom like leaning on community and really good, strong friendships uh, to give her that inner strength um, that led to so much, um, you know, beautiful things that, that, happened in her life? And then how has that influenced, you know, you and I sort of in our life, life choices and our life patterns, um, see, seeing that in, in mom? I mean, I think I'm going to answer that probably not in the most thorough way, but you're right. Um, I, I remember when I had little kids in New York City and, uh, and several of my friends had left. It was sort of the time 
when you have little kids in New York city and it's really hard, <laughs> you know, we're on a third floor walk up, but like, it's just not easy. And like, I didn't have a Margaret, <laughs> There's, you know, like, you know, it's just not this, you know, I didn't have those, you know, in some degree, like, you know, we had some friends, but that lack of friends who are family, who you can just call to vent. And I've developed some of that. You know, I also, she didn't, you know, I think we thought of her as working. She worked part-time when she had little kids. So, you know, there's this myth of like mom is super and like she leaned in, but she took time and, and, and I think it's been in the, in the years since Matthew was born, trying to build up that community of people that I can lean on because you can't do it alone um, has been really important to me. Um, and, you know, I think of, of the women who used to come and spend time with us. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get teary, just Pam and Melinda and Judy, um, who were so important to us and, and teaching us what family was, um, and that it doesn't have to be, you know, someone you're related to. It can be the friends around you who are swoop in and take care of you and support you. Um, Bill told that story about mom going back and not having any, like <laughs> having, um, needing anywhere to stay. And, you know, I just lived with Margaret and David when I wrote that book, like, I was like, I'm coming to write a book. I'll be at your house for weeks. <laughs> and they just opened the door. And, um, and yeah, I think that that community is just so important in being able to, to do the work, right? You can't do the work if you don't have that, if you're not taken care of. Um, mm. I was going to talk to Susan's question because I, I think a lot about, I've thought a lot about anger because <laughs> I get mad a lot, just like my mom, you know, whenever I get mad at my kids or whatever, I feel her, like I may talk like her and look like her, but when I'm mad, I'm like, just, I feel her in me. Um, she was just really good at it. Like you could tell she was mad at them for the right reasons. You know, I have almost been fired from a job for insubordination at this point in my life. Um, and I think like the, the, the lesson from that is, is it's, she taught me it's okay to be mad. Um, if you're thinking about like, why am I mad? And, and again, like talking to God, um, you know, I am not a very religious person. I don't go to church regularly. John's church has been the churchiest I've been in a long time, but I do talk to God a lot. Um, and, and a lot of it is just to yell at God, <laughs> just to say, I'm so mad. Um, and I think that like letting that out is one way to then focus yourself. And what are the things I'm mad about? And, um, and for me, they are motivating. Um, I'm the kind of person who, you know, I get mad and then I get busy. Um, and I think my mom was that kind of person too. You get mad and then you get busy, um, you know, trying to fix the things that are making you so angry. Mm. Uh, that was an answer to the question that Susan put in the chat room. Is that what you want? Um, let me read that just so everybody will know. Um, uh, Susan Lockwood says, so appreciate your honest owning of fury and anger. Uh, are there ways that our, our anger not only belongs to God, but how can we use it for justice? Uh, so that was what you were responding. I was just thinking you're in pretty good uh, company with um, uh, Job uh, and uh, you know, some of the prophets who got angry, uh, Jeremiah and so forth. Um, so uh, I, I think I was brought up to think, you know, you should never be angry. You know, a good Christian uh, will not get angry, but uh, uh, you know, the, that's, that's simply not, it's not realistic, first of all, and it's not, um, it's not even very biblical uh, since some of the classic works of the Bible were born out of anger. Um, if you're not angry, you're also probably not paying close enough attention. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, um, Sarah, I didn't really know your mom. 
I saw y'all sitting on the pews, but I've gotten to know since she left, I've gotten to know some of her friends that the church was just so much bigger then. And um, I just didn't really know that same group in the church. And the more I've gotten to know her friends and the way they've talked about her, I always wished I did know her. And to hear you talk about her, um, I just loved it because it gave me a whole lot of insight to why they love her so much. And um, yes, that whole idea of being angry and it's okay to be angry and then figure out what's really going on. Um, I liked all that, but you've given me a real appreciation for who your mom was besides just this person I always heard was wonderful. And um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Does anyone else have questions or comments you'd like to share? We have plenty of time if you do. Um, okay, here's one from um, Tina Ward Pugh. Uh, Dean Davis told us if someone is not mad at you at all times, you are not doing your job. My comment on that. I love that, Tina. I feel like that's how journalists roll. Like we know we're doing a good job if we're getting angry letters. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, we know we hit, we struck a chord and that we're getting people to pay attention, right? Um, also, that we're, for us, that we're trying to strike it down the middle a little bit sometimes. Um, but um, yeah, we just did a story on how climate change is um, really just sabotaging schools and education at the time when we least need that, right? Um, and the nasty, awful letters that um, that our reporter got. But it also, you know, for us, you know, we get letters like that all the time, but it was also a reminder, you know, like there's plenty of other people out there that read that. That means a lot of people read that story and hopefully people are paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of bravery to talk about the clergy sexual abuse and I, I appreciate you doing that. Um, I was not aware of, of that having happened to your mother, but I am aware of it uh, being too prevalent within the church and the statistics you gave, of course, are very uh, challenging to think about. I think we we do need to find with prayer how to address that, how to be compassion and hope for those who do experience that. As, as an ordained minister myself and a chaplain, I know the pain so often it can't be talked about and the anger I appreciate you sharing about your anger uh, in 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 its context uh, sometimes all we can do is be present do you think sometimes just being present with those who are hurting because of the church because of the leader of the church you know what I'm saying uh, what can be said, what can be done, except to be present and speak as you have. That's why I say it takes a lot of courage, and I thank you for doing that. And you did it right at the outset, and that's that's a beautiful gift. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, we hadn't we haven't really talked about it before, so this is kind of the first time that. We've talked about this as a family with anybody else. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the things my mom did was, you know, in the papers that I read a lot of her work, which I had not done before, when, which is kind of embarrassing, but there, you know, the academic papers that she had done 
Um, and a lot of it is, is what to do, right? Like telling social workers, particularly um, here are the steps that you take and here are the, you know, the, the strategies to help. And John's going to talk about uh, trauma healing in his talk. Um, but I think that was one of the gifts that she gave was, you know, what, what should people do to help folks heal? Debbie Brashear has a comment. She says, how can we not be angry in the world in which we live? Uh, if you want to comment on that. Right, I just write on Debbie. <laughs> oh, <you just> <laughs> I agree. What we do with it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing about, uh, Dale asked, tell me more about your work. And, you know, I'm a journalist. Um, journalists are sports. We are, uh, we are the wallflowers, right? We sit on the sidelines. We don't participate. That is kind of what defines us. You know, I talked about participating in justice. Journalists are not supposed to participate. Um, but I think most of the journalists, the good journalists I know, the reason they do the work is because they're just pissed off at the way things are. Um, and they do it because they believe this is an unjust world. And their participation is listening to others, right? That, you know, that's why I feel called to this particular profession um, is because the, the work is listening to others and telling other people's stories and sort of uncovering things that are wrong in the world. Um, but yeah, I work at a, a, a nonprofit news outlet where we, we write about, um, specifically we write about inequity and equality in schools. Um, and then we also write about innovation, which is sort of the flip side, what to do about it. Um, so I work with a newsroom of about 20, 20 people and um, about more than half of those are reporters out all over the country um, looking at you know, the problems in our schools and particularly the kids who've been disenfranchised, left out, um, have not been treated equity, uh, equitably. Um, hi, Sarah. This is Jason. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your vulnerability. Um, thank you for helping me as one who never had the chance to meet your mom, get better acquainted with her. Um, but while we're talking about your work and while I'm sitting in a car with two JCPS elementary school students, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just follow up um, on that. I, I'm just curious uh, from your from your vantage point, um, do, do folks pay careful attention still to um, what, what is happening in JCPS? Is that something that you continue to, to follow? Um, uh, what, what is the national perspective? Um, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, I mean, so I personally follow what's going on in JCPS because I am, you know, it's a, I have a personal connection and I'm always curious and I think it's one of the most interesting um, school districts in the country. Um, I follow the courier, the two courier journal education reporters, by the way, seem fantastic as far as I can tell. Um, really good reporters, um, which, so you're lucky to have them working, um, digging into documents and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think right now we, we cover schools nationally and we've been having conversations on our staff about how incredibly difficult it is um, always for reporters, you know, living in New York City, we have folks around the country to get a grasp on what's happening as a trend line in schools in the US because of local control and, you know, the, the vast variety and disparity that exists in our, our um, national school system. System is maybe not even the right word. Um, it's gotten so much harder um, because um, you know, COVID policies and um, fights over critical race theory. And there's just so many um, division points and so much variety in the way school districts are being allowed to respond um, that, um, that it's hard. I th it's, it's become really difficult for, for those of us who are trying to keep tabs on what is going on in schools across the country to even say anything coherent because it's just not coherent completely chaotic. Um, and that's scary, I think. Um, you know, as a, a, our organization is, is trying a variety of ways to sort of get 
tabs on by touching in on, on some different places to get a sense of what's going on, how parents are feeling, um, how kids who've been left behind even more than they were before being, um, are being treated. And yeah, so I could go on and on, Jason, it's really hard. I feel like some of the really interesting things and important problems that Louisville sort of brings to bear for the rest of us to pay attention to have been just buried uh, because of fights over masking and fights over, you know, quarantining and stuff that is really important, but also, you know, also in some ways very superficial to what needs to be happening in schools this year. Thanks, Sarah. It, it'll be really interesting, I think, to see uh, that there's the proposal to not not move back to neighborhood schools uh, as they existed pre-desegregation, um, but it, it does appear as if um, uh, uh, making neighborhood schools uh, an increased option for um, kids all throughout JCPS is coming our way, perhaps this academic year. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah. Angela Dennison uh, asks, I was just about to ask you uh, what you make of the CRT arguments in school boards and state legislatures. Yeah, I mean, it's such an interesting, I think, you know, as we, it's a manufactured crisis, right? Like this is something that I could send the link. The guy has the great article about sort of where this fight over CRT came from. Um, you know, I think it is standing in, right, for, um, bigger rifts in our society, political rifts, racial rifts in our society. Um, and it's really unfortunate because I think, you know, talking about like what CRT, and it, we've, we've talked a lot about like what CRT even means and, and what critical race theory stands for. And so, I mean, it's something I studied in college in sociology classes, you know, this is not something that necessarily is being addressed in K-12 schools. Um, but that is beside the point, right? That explaining what actually CRT really means is beside the point. And that the fights really sort of highlight this crisis point that we have in our schools about how do we um, teach our kids about our history? And, um, you know, how do we understand the inequities that still exist and, and explain those to our kids? Um, who will be, you know, at some point in charge of either fighting that, you know, the history of inequity or, um, or carrying it on. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say, you know, we have some, we have some stories planned looking at it, um, but it's been very complicated to figure out what is the right story to tell um, that isn't just covering these fights or explaining what CRT is yet again to try and explain to people, well, it's not really, you know, a K-12 curriculum issue. It's something that comes from academia, um, but really trying to understand like what is the root of these conflicts and is there a way for us to get past those um, in a way that, that benefits and helps kids. Alice Adams asks, will your comments be available to us in print at uh, some point? Um, each of your questions about how can we do justice when are so thought provoking and I would like to spend more time thinking about each one. Um, I could send you a copy of the talk, that's no problem. Um, I'm a writer, not a speaker anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would prefer you just read it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and you know what, there's a reporter on, so he's gonna be writing about, um, there's gonna be a report in the, in the news. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'll absolutely provide that to you, Bill, and maybe you could. Okay. I mean, I could, I, yeah, I could uh, provide it to you. Uh, let's see if there are more questions. Um, Dale Tucker says, just tell us more about your work. Well, I. I do you guys really want to? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I tried to address that earlier. Um, you know, I will say one of the challenges that, that we are facing right now as reporters um, is, is a lot of reporters I know, again, are sort of, like I said, 
exhausted and fed up and just really frustrated. Um, but also one of the questions I deal with a lot is how do we stay neutral? How do we continue to be the witnesses instead of the participants? Um, and that is one of the on always, always, I think that's always a conversation. I mean, every new generation of journalists, I think also grapples with that. Um, but it's a conversation that's come up a lot. How do we, in a world where like the very truth is politicized, how do we, um, how do we continue to be witnesses who try to be neutral? Um, and I don't, you know, it's, it's just a struggle. It's a discipline. Um, there's no easy answers, but it's something that we've been struggling with a lot, talking about a lot. Um, Go ahead. Sarah, uh, one of the, uh, you sort of just hinted at one of the things that I've been uh, struck with as I've listened to you today. And um, the, the theme that keeps coming back of what Diana did as she listened to the women who had been victimized as you uh, have done through your books, particularly the one about the gang uh, members. And I think what you're calling us to in terms of uh, seeking justice, which is bearing witness. Uh, bearing witness to, and perhaps that's one of the first steps, bearing witness to others' pain, bearing witness to others' stories that we might not want to hear, um, and then um, seeking ways that we can be transformative, um, be transformed ourselves, perhaps uh, also, and be transformative in a world um, that is so polarized. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Kelly. I love that. Thanks. Um, John Arnett wants to know if you're familiar with uh, ADOS, American Descendants of Slaves Movement, and uh, do you see what will happen with the reparation movement? Um, thanks, John. I'm not familiar with um, a the ADOS, um, but I'd be interested if you want to email me about it more it's but I, we have been doing some really interesting there's some some movement happening around reparations and in, in higher ed so universities grappling with their role in um slavery and um and and paying communities back in different ways um you know there's some arguments right now around how that should look whether it's community grants and whether that's enough um, or, you know, reduced tuition, that kind of thing. So there's some really interesting conversations that um, are very specific to higher ed, but I think a really interesting movement that's happening and that we're, universities are recognizing that, yes, we need to do this. Okay. Amelia Davisman wrote a comment, not a question. Um, I remember well the days when Diana and Paul were no longer at SBTS and they had somewhat similar experiences, I think. Does anyone have any other question or comment you want to make now? Yeah, in responding to Angela's uh, comment about mom being involved in, in reparations and Baylor's efforts. Uh, Sarah, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with someone who's, who's in ADOS and in higher ed. We were just doing anti-racism talks. Um, with some college kids. And what we really came to is what it does is it is confronting the three main questions that always block seeking justice when it comes to racism and when it comes, when it, comes to, I'm, it's the same three questions I always get when I deal with immigrants. And the first, they're all fear-based questions. But when you're talking about reparations, you're really hitting head on these three questions. And the first one is like, is this legal? actually do this is this like financially legal same thing with immigrants like should we take them is it legal for them to come here and the second question is why should we have to pay um like or do we have enough money to pay it's the financial question the financial fear question um and then the third question of course is like how will this change us uh and we're afraid of change um and this will this will lead to this will lead to that change. And I think what, what any talks 
take those those um, those fears head on um, and really really disrupt people and get a lot of pushback. Um, I think mom took on those three questions a lot, certainly, certainly professionally. I think you've frozen up, John, uh, or we're freezing up. Uh, uh, let's see if there are any other questions. Betty McEntee had a um, comment that she just wants, thank you for doing the work that you do. Um, Angela Dennison has another comment. I can imagine your mother would have been so involved with Baylor's efforts to acknowledge its past and reparations. So any comment about that? Or... I think so. <laughs> I'd like to think so. Okay. Uh, Pat Cole um, uh, make, makes this, ask this question. Social media seems to be carrying the public discourse in many sections. How does that affect your work as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the, the frustrations with social media, I mean, the great thing about it is that you can reach so many people. You can hear what's going on in different communities in a way that was impossible before. Um, but I think things have changed a lot, right? And, and because social media is structured around um, getting people to react, um, that it goes to our worst instincts, right? Um, you know, John, John has taught me as a parent, um, he's always great with when our, our kids are fighting, um, he would always say, well, she's trying to get a reaction. <laughs> and so, and I use that with my own kids, you know, like talking about provoking and reacting as like the source of conflict, right? Um, and that's how we are on social media. Um, the goal is to provoke and react. And, and that is not the basis for usually for doing good in the world um, very often when you're out just to poke at people um, and get them to react to you, especially with no context, um, you know, in the tiny space uh, that Twitter, for example, allows. Um, so I think it's created some really, um, you know, while it's opened up and allowed us to hear stories from corners of the world that we wouldn't otherwise hear stories from or, or hear how people are reacting, um, it also has become just very toxic. And, um, you know, I, a lot of our reporters, people are taking breaks. Um, I think for journalists who are on online, there's oh, so many are need to take a break because of just the nastiness. It's, you know, to be personally attacked, um, you know, a colleague who was attacked with homophobic slurs for a video he did on, um, you know, a very mundane education topic and just people went after him on Twitter. Um, it makes it even harder to do a hard job <laughs> um, and to have people question, not just, um, you know, whether this story is accurate or not, or, but you're very like, you know, personhood. Um, makes it really hard, um, I think, for journalists. And certainly that has become, you know, I think that the, the detriment has started to outweigh the benefits of social media in a lot of, a lot of spheres. Do we have any other comments or questions? Well, I have 3.20 Eastern time. Um, uh, John is scheduled at four. And um, if we take a break now, that'll give us plenty of time to um, do whatever we need to do between now and then. Uh, we will, um, I'm not sure how this works, but we're gonna keep a uh, screenshot on. And uh, John is gonna provide us with some music in the background. Uh, so um, if you um, have something else you want to do in the next 40 minutes, uh, 
feel free to do that, but be sure to be back at four uh, when we will hear John speak. Uh, All right. Would you like to wait until four or would you like me to start in just 20 minutes from now? Just take a quick 20 minutes. It uh, doesn't matter to me. What do I do? The only yeah. thing I don't know about is if someone was not able to get on earlier and if they're thinking, well, I'll, I'll get on at four, I wouldn't, I would hate for them to miss, but I don't know. Um, well, Melinda Strickland voted for a 15 minute break. So let's, and, and her vote counts more than most people. So let's, <laughs> let's just, um, let's just do a, let's do a, a how about a, um, a 17 minute break. I'll put the timer on the screen, let's do that. And go about our business and do this, that, and then I'll, I'll have the timer on. I'll play some music. We've heard a lot about Haitian immigrants in the news mm -hmm. uh, lately. Um, I'm going to just put some images of them on the screen. Here's some voices. Here's some singing. Um, and just of our experience here in South Texas. Um, so you can listen or, and watch or not. Um, my daughter is going to do a little narration of this, that, and the other. So, um, And Alice, you can get home in 20 minutes. All right, so I'm going to make it 20 minutes because Alice Adams fed me. Uh, for many years of my life and all those Wednesday dinners that I remember. So her vote also counts a ton. So uh, if you object, you need to call Melinda and Alice. And if you can override <laughs> your vote, then God bless you. Um, you wouldn't dare, you wouldn't dare contradict them. So. Yeah. We'll put their cell phones here in the chat. <laughs> they rebroadcast later if people somehow miss it. Yeah, I think it'll be, I think it'll be recorded uh, and then listen to me is much less fun than listening to Sarah. So um, I, what I'll do is I'll put a timer on the screen and then also we can listen to these, these and I'll, I'll see you all in 20 minutes. Does that sound good? Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wow. Boy. I wondered if she had shared that with anybody else. Uh, when I was in detention with the Cameroonian people was worshiping together, they teach me this song. They say, you it is English, you can understand. You are the reason why we are here, Jehovah. You are the reason why we are the Jehovah. Let me see. You are the reason why I still life, Jehovah. Jehovah Shama, you are the Jehovah Shama, you are the Jehovah Chikeno, you are the Jehovah. Look at this one. Over these last weeks and years, our church has received many, many families who are seeking asylum. We receive them not because our building and hospitality house is perfect, but because they belong to God. Our space is dedicated to serving those who are made in the image of God. We see most asylum seekers coming from Central America, making the difficult journey by road and train through Mexico. Or they come from Central Africa, first coming to Brazil, then through an extremely dangerous region of Panama called the Darien Gap, and then following the routes north. Poverty, 
violence, and failing governments force people to make a very painful choice to leave their home and their community so that they can save their children or seek hope for their families' futures. They're making huge sacrifices in love. We get to witness part of their journey. Sometimes they are with us for a couple of nights. Other times it takes weeks for them to find the loved ones who are waiting for them. Other times they move in and become long-term members of our family. That has been wonderful. Sometimes we receive families who have not moved across borders, but they are running away from a violent person. S someone who should love them is hurting them. They need a safe place to stay. They stay with us not because we are good and perfect people. They don't stay in our church and hospitality house because it is a perfect place. They stay with us because our space, our bedrooms, our tables belong to God. Our things are dedicated to serving those who are made in the image of God. It is really amazing that we get to see such loving people who have given up so much out of love for their children and families. It is amazing to hear God saying, all of this is mine, but you can use it to be loving and hospitable. It is even more amazing to hear God saying, you are mine too. Let's do all of this together. From the San Antonio Mennonite Church, I'm John Garland, the pastor here. And we're gonna go to the songs again of Deo and Kabibi. You'll notice that um, the Deo is singing into his cell phone here playing his guitar in the church. On the other end is his wife. She's in one of the immigration prisons uh, waiting for reunification. Kabibi is singing along. Uh, Deo and his family are from uh, Angola. Kabibi is from the Congo. They met on the way, uh, the long journey through South America and Central America and then Mexico uh, to arrive here. Uh, let's hear these words. Uh, the ba they're based on Psalm 40. And Deo rearranged um, the psalm into this song uh, for his wife. You know how whenever you call to the prison line, uh, they tell you they're listening in, they're recording the call. Those gravelly, hard to hear prison lines they're listening in on. Right after Deo and Kabibi sang this song uh, to his wife, a third voice came on the line and said, one of the guards there, one of the listeners in, this third voice said, that was so beautiful. 
Uh, could you please play that song again? What a gift uh, that the faith and the hope and the love can pass through the iron bars and the concrete walls and pass through these systems into real human hearts. Um, we ask for change. We ask for liberation. Um, we ask for healing. We ask that that love would permeate everything. This next song, um, I, I think might be my favorite of all time. I, uh, when I'm feeling down, um, I listen to Dale and Khabibi singing this song. It's based on the words of Hannah, uh, the mother of, of Samuel um, in, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, she's, she's wrapped up in all of this shame and impossibility, and then she busts out with this song. Um, and this is in Lingala. Uh, that language that jumps the border of the Congo and Angola. So here are the words of Hannah uh, in the voices of Deo and Kabibi. You know, uh, one of the things that we've done as a church here in San Antonio uh, for our asylum-seeking brothers and sisters is we started up a little a little coffee shop. 
a simple little thing for uh, the neighborhood, a way for the families to uh, work and support their families, but also connect uh, to the community. So let's, let's go to Rosita and hear a little bit about how that works. Hola, buenos días. Um, soy Rosita. Mm, pues uh, estoy eh, aquí en la traila del café, café cotidiano. Y pues las ventas están increíbles. <ríe> Esta mañana han habido muchas personas y estamos orgullosos de este pequeño negocio. Y, y vamos a crecer. <ríe> Podemos... Uh, mostrar, puedo mostrarles un poco adentro oh. ok, estamos aquí oh, son las máquinas del café y podemos observar tenemos diferentes tipos de lates como el de Mexican Vanilla y café de olla y tenemos muchos más <ríe> puedes venir a tomar tu cafecito es un lugar tranquilo oh, y puedes venir a relajarte puedo mostrar el lugar oh, estamos acá está súper hermoso el lugar puedes descansar y relajarte por un tiempo <ríe> en el que salí de Honduras salí por eh, en las condiciones en las que se encuentra nuestro país eh, son muy difíciles yo estaba estudiando y por el motivo de, de la violencia o las situaciones económicas no pude continuar y fue por la cual yo decidí emprender ese viaje para acá es este país que ya que es un país con con oportunidades y, y aquí estamos, gracias a Dios, luchando cada día por salir adelante. Estuve mucho tiempo en detención, que fueron siete meses. Um, no tenía apoyo de nadie y, y gracias a Dios que me abrió puertas en el camino y y pude llegar con Pastor John Garland luego de que él pudo ayudarme en muchas ocasiones como pagar un abogado este, en cartas de recomendación, cartas de apoyo él siempre estuvo para mí en todo momento y pues fue algo increíble de que pudo haber sucedido y entonces uh, Pude salir de detención con una fianza muy alta, pero gracias a Dios y la ayuda de todos los miembros de la iglesia, oh, pude salir y, y quedar en libertad. Y llegué acá a San Antonio en manos del pastor, llegamos a casa de María y Marta, pues nos sentimos eh, en ese lugar tan seguro. Oh, ya teniendo la libertad y con el apoyo de las personas, es algo increíble ese apoyo tan incondicional que nos han brindado. Y aquí estamos eh, de pie y siempre agradeciéndole a Dios por las grandes maravillas que siempre hace. Comment te dis que je ressens Tes bienfaits sont trop grands Il faut de mon âme pour de là Qui traduisent le silence Comment te dis que je ressens Tes bienfaits sont trop grands Qui font de mon âme pour de là Okay. 
last one. If I may say just a word here, I want to uh, thank Sarah so much for her contributions to this conversation today. And I wanted to say to Sarah that during the uh, intermission, I was talking with my wife, Judy, and she said, Sarah is so well-spoken. And uh, yesterday, Sarah was saying she was not an accomplished speaker, but I want Sarah to know if Judy says you're an accomplished speaker, you are an accomplished speaker. <laughs> so that's a kind word there. Secondly, I want to thank Bill Thomason and the uh, lecture team for all the work that goes into this happening uh, each year. Uh, uh, technology can make it easier or it can make it harder but I want you to know a great deal of effort goes into this. And Bill, I want to thank you and all of those uh, who helped make this happen. My last word for the day is I get to introduce John and uh, John's already been introduced to us, but let me say a few words um, about John. He, he serves as the pastor of the San Antonio Mennonite Church. He continues to explore and implement creative, creative ministries to help those who have been hurt traumatized, abused, neglected, forgotten, the least of these. Uh, John ex accents the importance of hospitality, story, and prayer-centered centered community and helping others towards healing. He is pursuing doctoral studies at Baylor University with attention given to communal trauma, spiritual res resiliency, and the Psalms. Um, John and his wife, Abby, have two daughters, Aurora and Azalea. Uh, John will lead our conversation now uh, concerning loving mercy. John, we appreciate all you're doing. What I'm thinking is uh, you're doing ministry that you'll be writing about because there's no manual for what you are doing. And um, that's daunting but we are so grateful for what you are doing and we will hear you gladly now. You know, we always sat in the same place, uh, the same pew uh, every morning. Um, and we could, we could see up to the balcony where all the cool kids sat. And I sat next to my mom and sometimes she would fish out a, a mint for me. But we, I remember vividly uh, hearing Bill pray and hearing his voice uh, from that beautiful pulpit uh, resonating through that that room, uh, and I remember I, the vivid memory that, that that comes to me is my mom trembling with uh, with tears as he led one of those beautiful pastoral prayers, um, and and feeling in that moment is like this is what it means to pastor. This is what it means to lead people uh, in prayer, and and how that's uh, yesterday when we first connected again, just setting this up. I was I was really shooken by. <laughs> by the voice again of my childhood. And I could just feel, feel mom next to me, uh, trembling with that, that movement of, of the spirit uh, in all of this. And we were talking about this huge conflict. Um, we were starting to sort of this, this point at which sort of mom took on the systems, took on the power. And, and, and Sarah's asking this like rhythmic question of how do we do justice um, in these places? and and Micah 6 8 says, do justice or seek justice or however we want to translate the Hebrew. And then it's and then it's love mercy or it's love hesed. That's the word in Hebrew. It's love hesed. And Bill was talking about that was the name of their Sunday school class. Um, and 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 there it's not like a step by step. You don't just do justice. And then once you've done that, then you start loving hesed. There's this mutuality, it's all walking humbly with God. Um, you, you walk humbly with God and that looks like you're seeking justice and you're loving on this mercy. You're loving on this unconditional love, this forever love. Hesed is one of the most important words in all scripture, uh, certainly in the Psalm, certainly in the prayer. Um, but we're talking about this conflict and I, I've, I've noticed that when we are all worked up about injustice in the world, we make a choice often as human beings. Sometimes we will choose to be right. Sometimes we choose to be on the right side. Sometimes we're going to say our institution and what it stands for needs to be correct. 
And we call this like orthodoxy. Uh, sometimes we call this um, uh, fundamentalism. Uh, sometimes we call this um, being a Pharisee. Uh, sometimes we call this, uh, you know, just being correct. I'm an Anabaptist, by the way. That was my big childhood rebellion. I was like, I'm no longer a Baptist mom and dad. I'm an Anabaptist. And Anabaptists are just right. Uh, they're right about everything. The theology of Anabaptists is right. Um, there's a huge danger, huge danger in being right. Um, it is a great way to defend yourself from the injustice in the world. It's a great way to make yourself feel pretty good about where you stand in an unjust world. But it is really, really dangerous because you just basically find yourself in an idolatrous place. And sometimes you look at that idol and it looks just like yourself. Um, and, you know, we look back on moms like standing up to the system. She was standing up to that idolatrous choice of being right. We are going to, in the face of all the problems in the world, we choose to be right. Um, there's another choice. And the other choice is to participate in healing, to love on Hesed or love with Hesed. You can, you can either be right or you could participate in the healing. You can either be right and defend yourself and build the wall and be like, I don't want to deal with all that injustice. I want to be right. Or you can say, oh, no, I'm going to go out past the edge of the wall. I'm going to go to the margins. I'm going to go into the dark places, the valley. I'm going to go into the dry places, the deserted places. And I want to love on mercy. I want to love with mercy. I want to participate in Hesed. And let me tell you, I was really taken by that, that choice. I was moved by that choice. I was like, that is how I want to pattern my life. I want to follow the people who go to the margins. I wanna follow the people who love with Hesed love. I wanna follow the people who are sort of gallantly, bravely saying being right is for the smart people. I wanna be a loving person. Um, and, uh, and, and I also wanna warn about the massive danger of that. Uh, the danger of saying, I wanna be a worker, God. Um, I wanna be a social worker. I wanna be a healer. Um, I want to be a, a pastor. Uh, and that danger is the danger of trauma. Um, and that danger is the danger of secondary trauma. Um, this, this idea, I thought, y'all, I thought if I just helped people, if I just loved on hurt people, I'd be, I'd be okay. Uh, that's what Jesus wanted me to do. And Jesus would be there and I would be fine. And I had no idea. I went down the border after graduating and, uh, and, and lived on the border in this little community and served uh, recent immigrants. And then we moved to, to, to San Antonio. We had little kids a decade later and we're serving these, these asylum seeking um, immigrants. And we're seeing just the worst traumas you can imagine, loss of home and loss of innocence and loss of all connection and culture um, and horrific uh, traumas. And I was serving them saying, I am soldiering on, uh, serving the least of these, doing what's right, loving with this Hesed love. Um, and I, I, I honestly did not understand the creeping effects of secondary trauma. Um, I'd grown up in beautiful privilege, wondrous privilege. I had no right to be experiencing any of these effects of, of trauma or secondary trauma. Uh, so I would, I would push that off um, or not, not, really, not really take it on, not really look at it clearly. And y'all, it was, it was at my mother's death. It was, a, it was not good. It was not good. It was, a, it was a horrific death. It was a long and painful. Y'all, I bet you a number of us have sat with people who've died of cancer. It's not good. Um, and, uh, what I did was the right thing. <laughs> you sit there, uh, you feel the trembling and you sit there afterwards, you do the right thing by your dad. You prepare the body. She wanted to donate her organs. So we did all the things that was necessary there. And you work with the, the, the mortuary folks and you do this and that. No, oh, you got to take care of your family. You got to take care of your daughters. You got to explain death to your daughters and read the books at night. And you do this and that. You got to take care of your wife. And there's all these other things. And I was doing all the right things. And it was about uh, a month in after that, 
where I was completely dysfunctional. I was staring at the wall. I was not doing anything at all. And, it, and I know depression. I work with a lot of people uh, who suffer from depression. This it was it looked like depression, but it wasn't depression. Um, it was really kind of high levels of anger that didn't make sense at the time. It was fixating on weird things. I kept opening drawers, like looking for things, sort of obsessively looking for things, this bizarre behavior. If you're around trauma victims, you're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I didn't understand at the time until, uh, until someone took me by the shoulders um, and, and looked me in the face and like, John, you know, you know, you're loved and you need to cry. And it was that it was there, there's, there's this switch going off. And at the same time, I was hearing people talk about, you know, healing of trauma, this, that, and the other. And I realized like, oh my goodness, I need to dive into this. I need to figure out what is going on. I'm doing all the right things. Um, I'm loving as much as I can love. I'm still like staying up late at the shelter or hospitality house and, and uh, caring for folks and I'm reading to my kids and loving on them. And yet I am not functioning. I'm not loving rightly and I'm not receiving love rightly. And you have this message, this word, it's this simple word. It's like, oh, it's trauma. <laughs> and here I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm now like 15 years in as a pastor. So I'm supposed to, you know, at this point you're supposed to know what to say. Um, and I had this this uh, moment, I went into the church late uh, to uh, just to have some quiet time to, to pray. I was supposed to preach some dandy sermon the next day. And I walk into the church, uh, flip on one of the lights. You do the same thing. You look up at the front of the church and you think, you see, oh my goodness, there in the middle of our church is trauma. And I, I never even, even seen it before. There in the middle of our church, we had this, this thing sitting up in the front middle of everything. It's this, um, it's this lynching tool. It's this, it's this thing that empires use to traumatize entire communities. It's this thing that you use to torture someone to death in front of their mother. It's this thing you use to, to, to strike fear and hurt into generations of people. And we have it up in the center of our church. It's in the middle of Crescent Hill Baptist Church too. And, and we, we look at that symbol and we see it as trauma transformed into victory over death. Uh, and I was really shaken by that. Like as a pastor, as someone who's going to preach the good news, we're talking about a faith movement that is centered in the transformation of trauma. Um, it's centered in taking the image of communal trauma and turning it into the image of death conquered. And then, and then I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, you know, a few weeks ago, I introduced someone to our church. They became a part of our church by going through a drowning ritual. They, they came down to the water and got by some guy all dressed up, held her under the water where she could not breathe and where she could not live. And then this pastor with a funny beard and blue eyes pulled her up and said, you are introduced to new life. And now you have a new family. And this is an eternal family. It's a, for, a forever family. Um, you are forgiven and you are adored forever. To join, a, to join most Christian churches, you have to go through this drowning ritual, this transformation of powerless trauma into um, becoming a part of a family. And then I was thinking, I looked at the front of the church, and there's this beautiful one in the front of Crescent Hill Baptist Church, but ours is a little more simple in our church, but it's the place where uh, we do it every week now in our church. You take a body and you rip it apart and then you pour blood everywhere and then you tell people to come on up and eat. It's this nasty, horrifically nasty ritual of trauma, the worst kind of human trauma and disgust and horror transformed into communion with one another and communion with God, like a forever communion uh, that's at the center of the church. So I, I was blown away by like, what in the world are we doing as Christians to have these 
three symbols at the center of our faith movement, trauma transformed at the center of our faith movement. How audacious of us to put that up in front of everyone. Uh, and then the question stirs me, how are we transforming trauma? What are we doing uh, as a body of faith, as a movement of faith? to transform, transform trauma. Um, that, that really was, was um, a, a, a super important moment for my ministry, for our hospitality work too as a church. We talk about this all the time, the, the transformation of trauma, the participation in the transformation of trauma. And you know, one word for that, a simple word for that is hesed, uh, this mercy, this, this transformative mercy. We gotta love that. We love that. Um, another word for that is resurrection power. Um, the, the, this, this transformation of death and darkness and hurt um, and, and trauma. Uh, so I spent, I spent some time on that. I spent some time on that and tried to really, you know how pastors do, try to really, really simplify that and creating a model for trauma healing as a church. Um, and also reflecting on the many, many folks that we've hosted, thousands of asylum seekers that we'd hosted who had, who had dealt with so much trauma um, and seeing how that had affected, affected their lives. And then looking back at our own family and then looking at everyone around us and how, how much we were caught up in, um, in in the effects of trauma and what it was doing to us. So I simplified it. I made it really very, very basic. Um, and we as a church now and in our hospitality ministry, we just say trauma is a trap. And it's, it's as simple as that. Trauma is a trap. There's a bunch, uh, you know, in, in scripture, the word for trap is also a pit or it's a well or a cistern that didn't have a, low, uh, uh, a top on it, or it was a, um, it's a mire, um, or it's this, this quicksand, muddy, uh, slipping off the path into uh, this trap. And that's what trauma is. There's a bunch of different things that can dig the, pet, the pit. Um, it can be horrific experiences. It can be violence. It can be witnessing violence. Those kiddos at the bus stop, in Louisville this week, um, there, is a, there is a pit dug in their life from what they saw. Um, the, the families who have been torn away by horrific violence from safety and home, um, this is digging a, digging a pit. It can also be dug by the lack of love. Um, when we reach out, those moments we reach out for love and it's not there. When we reach out for sustenance and it's not there. Um, this digs, it's just like a digger. It just digs uh, the pit a little bit deeper. Some of us have really, really deep, deep pits, deep traps. Um, and other of us have shallow traps. And it doesn't matter um, because what I've found in ministry is all the traps are full of water. Um, and if you're in it, you're drowning. And um, and, and we, have to, we, have to be, we have to be responsive to that as a faith movement. We do a lot of like trauma responsive uh, training in our church. And I think we're, we're talking more about, you know, how can we be trauma informed or trauma responsive? And also in our church, we really, really simplified that as well. Um, we'll do some iteration of this story of um, to be trauma responsive or trauma informed. You're walking down. This is how we, we always start the story. Something, something along these lines. You're walking down the sidewalk with a kid. It's your, it's your own kid or it's your, your niece, your nephew. You're walking down the sidewalk with a child. You're holding the child's hand. Uh, you're taking the child to school or, or something fun. And then you see off the sidewalk, not too far from you, is a woman. And she sees you. And as soon as she sees you, she starts to shout. And she starts screaming and you can kind of understand what she's saying, but not completely. And she's locking eyes with you. And now she's, she's sort of upping the tenor of your sc her screaming and she's using some obscenities. And she's also waving her arms all crazy. She's kicking her legs in a really sort of um, intense way. And she's looking at you and she's shouting. And then we turn back to the group. So what are you doing this? What are all the options? 
for this experience? What are you going to do in this particular experience? And, you know, people will say, oh, I mean, well, first thing you do is you protect that child. You're going to, or somebody like, you get out of there, get the kid out of there, get yourself out of there. So it's like, no, what you, you should ask for help. You should see who's around. You should ask for help. Um, or someone's like, you should call the police, probably. This is not safe for you. It's not going to be safe for anyone else coming along. Um, and, then, and then there's always the brave person who's like, oh, no, I'm going to shout back. She can't talk to me like that, especially while my kid is watching. She's not going to watch me, you know, um, insulted uh, by that. And then, I'll, then we'll pause at that moment. It's like, oh, I forgot a key detail. I'm sorry. I left out the key detail. The woman is in the water. You're walking along the boardwalk of the lake. The woman is, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned the woman's drowning. And there's this, there's this moment of like, oh my God, I was defensive. I was defending this, that, and the other. And I failed to see that the woman is drowning. And that is the case always with trauma. We never see, very rarely, we see other people's traps. We see that other people are in the water and they're drowning. When folks are drowning, and, and Margaret Graves can attest to this because she saved me from drowning, I think maybe twice. When people are drowning, they have no control over what they do. They do not have control over what they say, what they shout. They don't have control of their arms and legs. They don't have control over any of their biological processes. Your body just kind of takes over and, and goes into stress response mode. And when we see trauma victims, uh, it's really, really helpful to recognize that we are seeing uh, drowning victims who don't have control over their stress responses. Now, I always make it clear, you know, stress responses are God-given. We have to have stress responses to, to survive. Um, but we know trauma victims, when they are demonstrating their stress responses at really inappropriate times, so you know trauma victims are in that trap that was dug last week or 20 years ago or 40 years ago. They got caught up. There's a band that you yanked them back into their, into their pit, into their trap, and now all of a sudden they're drowning. And even though they shouldn't be, they're acting out of their stress responses, um, even though there's, they're not necessarily in a particularly dangerous place. They've been triggered. That's generally the word. They've been triggered. And all of a sudden, they are in the presence of that burning house. They are in the presence of their, their uh, friend dying. They're in the presence of their rapist right now in the room with us, even though we can't see him, um, even though we can't feel the flames, even though we can't uh, smell the smells. Um, they are in that presence, they're in that trap. I, you know, again, as a pastor, I try to make this part really, really simple. We look for five stress responses. Um, we, we, we watch for five stress responses, especially when they come at really bizarre times. By the way, this is kind of complicated, but we use this painting. I'm going to show it to you right now. Someone who came through our program made this painting. Um, and I want to show you, here's the, here's the pit, right? She's like, here's the pit. The trigger, she got yanked down. There's this elastic band that yanked her down into the pit. Um, and out of this trauma trap, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip up here. You really can only do five things. You can fight and you can run away. Um, that's the most common things that are easy to see. Another thing that we do is we fold. We just quit. We have to. We have to stay alive. We can't run on adrenaline all the time, so we just shut down. We don't take care of our kids. We don't get off the couch. We don't um, respond in the ways we ought to do. We don't take care of ourselves. We don't bathe. We don't do this, that, and the other. We just kind of quit. And the other thing we do is we, we will naturally fixate. Now, we don't do all of these things at the same time, but we'll, we'll, we'll alternate. Some people really do one thing more than other. Fixation is like when you're really completely focused on one thing, bizarrely. Uh, I need to get to that one place. I need to talk to that one person. I need to hear that one, I, one song. I need to just do, I need to be there, this fixation. And the last one, and this is really upsetting to see, people freeze. We see this a lot with victims of sexual assault. A lot of times uh, victims of, of violent aggression freeze. 
They can't respond to their aggressor. And biologists think that might, that might save your life. That might prevent you from worse harm. But people in this trap will sometimes at really, it appears from the outside, random times freeze and not be able to talk, not be able to move, not be able to do anything. Um, and this is all because they're right here. They're, they're drowning. Um, and so th that's important for us when we are being, quote unquote, trauma informed, to see people and their stress responses as the natural biological responses to the fact that they're drowning. Now we go back to that story. You see that woman drowning in the lake. What do you do now? Are you going to call the cops? Are you going to shout at her? You're going to be like, woman, you better not say words like that to me. There's a kid who's listening. I don't want to hear any of that talk right now. Or, or you could go like this. Now, why did you get in that lake in the first place, sweetheart? You know you can't swim. I mean, there's all these things that you're like, that is ridiculous to say. And yet we do it all the time. We do it as a church. Uh, we certainly do it as, as public systems. Um, but, but what do we actually do as participants of this faith movement of healing, of trauma transformation? And generally the answer is something like, throw her a lifesaver or throw her a rope or if you're good if you're real good go in that lake if you know how to do it go in the lake but basically the answer is give her safety don't shout at her don't correct her the first thing you do is you give her safety um now, there's a whole bunch of uh, translations of this into Christian talk. Um, in, in Christian talk, we say giving someone safety. We call that sharing the good news. Uh, we call that evangelism. Uh, we say, evangel you know how the evangelism starts out. It says, it says, you are loved. And you are loved forever and ever and ever. Olam, amen. There's actually nothing you can do about it. You're adored. Um, and also you are forgiven. And you're forgiven for everything, like all of it. Even the stuff you don't even know, you're forgiven for that too. And you can't really forgive that. You can't really you know, earn any of that forgiveness. And you can't forgive God for forgiving you. You're just forgiven. So here's your life preserver. And there's all of these ways we um, embody that good news. We embody that you are loved and you are forgiven and you are safe. Um, if you want to talk to a psychologist about trauma healing, they will say, all trauma healing begins with felt safety, an experience of safety. If you want to do anything with trauma transformation, if you want to do anything with trauma healing, you have to, to create an experience of felt safety. Um, Christians say, if you want to do anything about change in the world, you need to start with the good news. You need to start with this message that God comes to us because God loves us and all of us and God forgives us and all of us. Let's start there. Um, now, another thing that we've learned about, about um, but by the way, that is a really, really strong mantra for us, especially when you're in the weeds and it's late at night and someone's having a panic attack or someone's being violent or someone's being, what we need to do right now is create felt safety. We need to create safety for everyone involved here. We need to get this person into an experience of, of safety. Now, there's another, there's another part of, of trauma that's real, real important be, uh, to understand and is deep, deep, deep down. Um, what it does to the heart. When we're in this trauma trap, um, it, it, what it does, frankly, just to be honest, it, it breaks our heart. It prevents us from loving and it prevents us from receiving love. We call this, psychologists call this attachment disorders. Um, I simplify it and be like, it's a spectrum, y'all. There is one side, it's really easy to see, it's disattachment. This says, I will not love anyone and no one will love me because I'm not safe and love is not safe. And so here's my wall, disattachment. On the other end of the spectrum is overattachment. And this is, I will love anything with power. The man who hurts me, I'm going to love him because he has power. 
and I'm going to show him attachment. I'm going to show him love. This system that, you know, exerts power, I'm going to just love on that. I'm going to love on anything that looks like it's bigger and stronger than me. This is called over attachment. Um, you see this a lot. Um, you know, Christian missions, sometimes missionary trips are based on this. You go to an orphanage um, in some hurting place and you walk in for a couple of days and all the little kids see you as powerful and they come up and give you a hug. Uh, that's not natural. That's an attachment disorder to meet a child for the first time and for them to want you to pick them up. Uh, that, is, that is them saying, I need to love anything that has power. These are called attachment disorders. Sometimes people do this. Some people, people go in this direction. Some people, sometimes people jump in between within you know, 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, these are called uh, attachment disorders. We had a kiddo staying in our guest room here with his mama. Uh, they're from Honduras. They escaped, escaped some absolute horrors. Cutest kid in the world. Um, it just did everything right. Never cried. Was always obedient. Always super loving. Wanted to cuddle up with me and read books. And just the, the cutest little wonder of a child ever. And a few weeks in, he had a night terror. And uh, we heard him screaming in the night. Um, and uh, I, was, I was worried about that. The next morning over breakfast, the mama was like, um, my kid had the funniest nightmare last night. It was so funny. He dreamed, Pastor, that you were mad at us and you were going to kick us out on the street. And I finally realized, oh, you're not cute. You're performing. You're not cute. You're terrified. You're not, you don't love me. You're afraid uh, that I won't love you. And it's a, it, was, it, was a, it was so heartbreaking and so revelatory what the trauma does to the heart. Uh, the heart, it will break our ability to love so that we will say, I don't want to love and I don't want anyone to love me, or I'm just going to love anything, quote unquote, love anything that has power. Um, we respond to attachment disorders also the same mantra. We need to create safety. If someone doesn't want to love and doesn't want to be loved, we give them persistent patience. Um, and if someone is dealing with attachment disorders of over-attachment, we, we are always putting them in a position in which they do not have to perform. Uh, oh, no, no, you're loved no matter what, forever and ever and ever, amen, olam, it's called hesed in the Bible, and you're forgiven, and there's nothing you can do to earn that. You're just forgiven. Um, so things you don't even know you're forgiven for, you're forgiven for. Um, let's, let's start there. We call that the good news, call that evangelism. This is the, this is the island. This is the, um, the uh, lifesaver uh, in that place of, that place of drowning. Um, so the, the other thing, the other thing then uh, to be uh, aware of is the Christian language we use around that. You know what we call attachment disorders in Christian language? We call that sin. You're loving the wrong things and you're loving, you're not loving rightly. You're, you're, you're avoiding love. You're preventing people from loving you and you're, you're loving on all the things of power. We call them idols in Christianity. Um, and, and we, we call that sin. How do we respond to that as, as a Christian church? Um, I, I got really, really uh, excited uh, in my in my biblical studies with the Psalms, because the Psalms are a prayer book. I mean, it's 150 prayers, and they're all organized by people enslaved in Babylon. They're all put together in order. You read them from beginning to end, and you'll start out in this deep place, horrific place of attachment disorder and anger, and all of the stress responses coming out at the wrong time, and it will lead you up, cycling up and down and up and down, eventually up into a place of praise. Um, you don't hear the word hallelujah till you get to about the end of the Psalms, and then you hear it all over the place. Hallelujah, praise, 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 praise God. We call praise, uh, the psychologists, by the way, call praise secure love-based attachment. Um, I can be loved and I can love. I am loved and I am a safe conduit of love. I have secure attachment, love-based attachment. Um, in our language, in Christian language, we call that praise um, or, or participating in the Hesed love of God. Another word we use is home. Uh, we're home or we're in the temple. We're in the presence of, of God. 
Um, so, so looking at that, we, I wonder like, well, how in the world are we supposed to do this? So, so we had this really great question from Kelly earlier. It's like, so what do we do? Like, how do we actively participate against all the racist structures? How do we participate against the ocean of trauma that is that we're up against? I, I mean, there, here's the Crescent Hill logo. We have this tiny little ship and this massive ocean. Um, and the ocean always in scripture is uh, instability and horror and trauma and, um, and powerlessness. And here is our little ship. What are we supposed to do with this little ship? Um, what are we supposed to do with our little uh, community of, of scared disciples? When oftentimes, y'all read it in Mark, Jesus is up in the front sleeping on a pillow. Uh, it sounds like um, one of the really good prayers, my favorite prayer uh, from the book, from the gospel of Mark is Jesus, do you not care that we're dying? <laughs> like, what the heck are you doing sleeping on a pillow? Um, would you please uh, wake up and just notice that we're dying? Um, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> And Louis Bailey's mentioning my solo from Narnia, which I hope none of y'all remember <laughs> from the inside out. Um, I love that. It's a, it's a prayer. It's a, this prayer of desperation of we don't know how to love rightly. And we're reacting with all these stress responses at the wrong time. Uh, don't you care that we're drowning? And of course, what's wonderful about shouting crazy stuff is, at Jesus is that Jesus responds. Um, and Jesus, there's always a, a response uh, to those intense prayers. In this case, I mean, if you want to just simplify it, the response is the good news. Uh, the response is this place of safety. Oh, this storm, I'm going to still that storm. Um, and it's, I love you. And I love you forever. It's, it's a love that comes from beyond before you existed, and it goes way beyond to the olam. Um, and you're forgiven, uh, you of little faith. You're forgiven for even the things you don't understand. Now, we've learned some other things about trauma. We've learned some other things about trauma transformation and trauma healing. Uh, we have to do this a lot. You begin, talk to a psychologist, begin all trauma transformation begins with an experience of safety. And then you, then you do correction. Once someone is in a, in a place of safety, they feel loved, they feel safe, then you can be like, stop that. Stop putting that in your body. Stop acting like that. Stop saying that about yourself. Stop believing that. Stop acting like you need to stop doing that. Um, but there's this really special thing. We, uh, the they name it in, in psychology, titrated pendulation. It's like a drip, 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 just enough so that you don't explode. So what a healer does is you place someone in safety and then you pendulate, you swing them out into correction and then swing them right back into safety. And then you swing them out a little bit more into correction and then swing them back into safety. You swing them out even further into correction and you swing them back into safety. Talk to a lawyer, do, do a deposition with a lawyer, and they want a linear, what happened to you? Next, 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 next. In the third hour, you're way out in the ocean and you're completely drowning. I talked to immigrants who've after their, their um, interview with a lawyer, they can't breathe for three days. If you talk to a healer, they'll ask you your story and if about 60 seconds, they're going to bring you back into right here, you're loved you're adored right here. You're safe. Let, let's go, let's go back to the story that you were telling, but remember that you're right here with me. They're going to swing out a little bit further. That will take a week. It will take five years. I've done that with folks for seven years uh, where they're just swinging out a little bit further into this, this dangerous uh, retelling of the story. Well, a, an easy way to look at that is um, you're guiding them as a listener. Uh, you're guiding them, you're accompanying them in their telling of their story into a really dangerous place from a place of safety. And then you're affirming all the parts of the story in which they are a survivor instead of a victim. Uh, you're listening to hear them say, and this is where I survived. That's a really great healing question, by the way. 
where did you receive the resilience to make it? Where in the world did you get the strength to get across that desert? How in the world do you survive in that little cabin up in the woods with no running water, like Sarah was saying about mom? Uh, how in the world did you make it, uh, sending your kid off uh, into that violent place? Um, where did the resilience come from? And what, what trauma healing does in the long term, and sometimes this takes long, long accompaniment, but it's you start with a place of safety and then you watch the correction. The correction is going to lead the story from a story of the victimization to a story of surviving or resilience. Now, those two things, swinging, by the way, I think about this taking my girls to the playground for the first time. You take them to the swing, they're on the swing, they're terrified. You push them just a little bit, they squeal and they come right back into your arms. You push them a little bit, a little bit further, they're screaming, they come right back in your arms. You hold them for a little while. And you push them a little bit more and, and off they go. And every time they swing out, their island of safety is getting larger. Their, their island of, in the Christian language, good news uh, is, is getting larger and larger. The Hesed love is permeating more and more of their experience. Um, and, and also, frankly, their identity. Um, I am a victim becomes I am beloved and I am forgiven. Um, there, the psychologists have a great word for this. The, the um, you know, uh, it, it, it leads into um, secure attachment. And that's how you get there. Uh, you get to experiencing safety, going into this titrated pendulation of, of, of correction. Um, and then that leads into this place of secure attachment. We, of course, call that praise. And we see that, by the way, we see that in the Psalms. Uh, we see that if you look for it, it's in all of scripture, this pattern of here you are safe and here you're adored. Now let's talk about your story. Let's talk about how you've suffered. And now let's come back in this place of safety. And now let's talk more about how you've suffered and how I was there with you. And let's come back to this place of safety and talk more. Um, you can watch this pattern. I'm working on a, on, a, on a study where we just trace that throughout all the Psalms um, from beginning to, to end this pendulation. Um, and, and then tracking all the stress responses that you will, uh, that you will, that you'll find, um, uh, it, uh, enumerated and given name to uh, throughout the scriptures. Um, one, one way that I summarize it, though, is like, if you just want to understand all of scripture, like the whole pattern and rhythm of scripture, just read Psalm 22 and 23. I, and, and you can almost, it's almost like a, this beautiful, um, this beautiful image of everything you need uh, in the scripture. And it begins really, really intensely, sometimes in that place where like we're beginning all ministry. You know, Psalm 22 is the one that Jesus quotes from the cross in, in the gospel of Mark. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, where in the world are you? You are so super far away and you're not even listening to my groaning um, and, and you're not answering me. There is no rest. And then it's going to pendulate. It's going to swing uh, and it will say, you're holy. Uh, I know you, I know you helped us. I know you rescued us. I know you became family with us. Uh, I know you loved on us and gave us this covenant, but it's going to swing back into the suffering. I'm a worm. I'm not even a person. And I am, I'm being treated so horrifically and I am being insulted and it's going to swing back into safety. And I, I think this might be one of the most uh, powerful descriptions of safety in all scripture. It says, you, you, you brought me forth from my, my mother's womb. You held me at my mother's breast. You held me as I suckled nourishment uh, as a helpless baby. What a beautiful, fabulous image of God's hesed. Um, don't, please do not leave me. Don't let me go from that place. And then it will swing back. And you have this crucifixion imagery. I'm surrounded by all these people that hate me and my body's falling apart. My, bone, my bones have fallen apart. My heart is melting like wax. They're, they're, uh, they're gambling over my clothing. They're casting lots 
Um, please do not be far away. And it's going to swing back. Save me, save me, save me. Uh, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna is the plural. Save us. Um, and then, then I will. And there's this magnificent image of the church. Uh, there, after on the other side of this trauma, I'm going to talk about you. I'm going to proclaim your name. We're going to talk about all the ways that you rescued us and saved us and given us this safety. And then Psalm 22 will lead us into Psalm 23. Um, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm not afraid anymore. Um, I'm no longer a victim anymore. I'm accompanied. I'm adored. I'm loved. I'm at the table. And yes, my enemy is at the table too. My enemy is sitting on the other side, probably looking at me with a nasty look, but I don't care anymore because my head is anointed and my cup is overflowing. Um, surely goodness, that's Hesed. Um, surely goodness and Hesed will follow me all the days of my life. Um, I'll dwell in the dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever, Olam. Um, there's this, there's th that's, I mean, that's that's powerful, um, and you see that pattern throughout all Scripture. Sometimes it's elongated, uh, and sometimes it's it's shorter, but it's this transformation of of trauma. Now there are all sorts of ways that we can do that logistically. Um, but we need we we do this thing we like look through a particular lens. We say we are healing trauma, which means that we are creating experiences of safety. We're experience our experiences of good news. We're doing that for ourselves regularly and rhythmically, and we're doing it for those who are hurt and broken in our midst. And then we're challenging. We're pushing. We're, we're really challenging and listening to stories and we're helping people recast their stories. And then we're bringing them back to that place of safety and communion and transformation and love. Um, and we're all, we're all doing it as we walk on the road, the way, uh, the way, um, uh, walk humbly uh, with your God. Um, in Greek, that's Otis. That's what the early church was called, people of the way. We're all walking on this way together. Um, in, into this place where we can where we can praise together. We pray every morning as a church. We pray the Psalms. We get up real early. We we kind of get together over Zoom now. We can't be in person, but we we end every session, y'all. Uh, every every morning prayer, um, we end by saying, "May the peace of Christ bless you and keep you, and walk with you on your long journey home." We're all walking home together, uh, and the idea is this rhythm. It's this rhythm of of healing. Of right here, we're safe and we're adored. We're going to step out uh, into transformation and step back in this place until that's the last step we take. And, and now we're, we're in that, um, that Hesed love uh, forever in the presence of, of the Lord. I've talked about a lot of things here. Um, I do a lot of work with immigration. Um, I also uh, knew my mother for a lot of years, not as many years as my sister. Um, but so I, I'd be happy to answer um, any questions that pop up around um, around immigration and the church, um, around trauma healing and the church, um, around uh, my mother or around being the younger brother of Sarah. Um, by the way, uh, we go I go and visit my dad and they, there's a bookshelf in his in his house and it has all of the books that my father and my mother and my sister have published. And it is like massive. I mean, there's so many books. I, I mean, it is just heavy. I might be a ton of books of all the books. And then there's the one thing uh, that I wrote in fourth grade and it's still in a little snap binder um, about the history of Kentucky and it's all plagiarized. It was all like cut and pasted, like actually cut and pasted out of the, um, the thesaurus. Uh, so anyways. I can answer questions about publishing in the Garland uh, household as well. So you can use that. You can use the chat. Uh, Chris Conver, who taught me a lot about the Bible uh, as my Sunday school teacher, uh, said, I am struck by memory of your mom telling a group of us that we had a responsibility as parents and significant adults to communicate to our children that they were safe and they were loved. Um, and my mom did that a lot. She pointed out how other people did that too. She's like, do you see what Mr. Rogers is doing right now? Like, do you see why he's so effective? Um, and she was so excited to meet him that one time. Do you see um, like how, do you, do you understand, John, why Goodnight Moon 
is such an important children's book and how it's helping a child who's actually afraid of dying. Uh, all kids are afraid of dying. They don't know how to articulate that. Every time they go to sleep, they're afraid of dying. Do you understand how Good Night Moon is helping them process and say goodbye? Good night, good night moon, good night air, good night noises everywhere. Do you see how that makes them feel so safe? Um, what, do you see how the colors are changing at each page? My mom was real good at that, of like pointing that sort of thing out. Um, and good for her saying that to you, Chris. <laughs> That's wise, giving people that sense of responsibility. So you can either put a question in the chat or you could, you could unmute, uh, you could challenge, you could ask a specific question or, or if you want uh, more specific stories about any of those areas. John, I'm curious, um, having just read Sarah's book on gangs in Garden City, that um, both of you seem interested in Central America, yeah. and I'm wondering if there's a, can, can you point to something that's pointed both of you in that direction? Sarah's fault. It's utterly Sarah's fault. I went to, in my high school, um, I had a horrible Spanish teacher and realized that I never wanted to take Spanish ever again. <laughs> it was completely worthless, and I would never use it. Um, so I didn't learn Spanish until I traveled to Mexico to visit Sarah. And she was uh, working on a story uh, on the UN and she took me around Southern Mexico and I heard my sister speaking a language I didn't understand. I was, I was absolutely blown away by it. Um, and I was really shaken. Um, and I was like, I need to do this. Um, and I spent more time in Central America and I, I, um, I learned Spanish in Central America. I lived there for a while. Um, I lived on the border of Texas and Mexico where no one spoke any English. Um, I pastored a church for 10 years, so just a Spanish speaking uh, church. And I've spent a lot of time now in Central America visiting um, the homes, the families of uh, immigrants that we've received, um, the border of Honduras and Guatemala. Um, and, and uh, you know, witnessing, Sarah interviewed, you know, leaders of MS-13 um, or was it MS-16? And she, um, and I, you know, I've also seen some of those towns that are ravaged by the, by the gang violence. I, one time, it was not too, it was right before the, the pandemic, I preached in a church uh, in this tiny little town in Honduras. Um, and you know how you, these little towns, I mean, they, these churches are rocking. I mean, you don't start till eight o'clock at night and you're lucky if you get home by 1030. And I mean, they are rocking uh, out, um, even though they, I mean, they have one little, one little speaker, but they, they crank that up and they're worshiping like crazy and dancing for an hour. And then they call on me to preach and they expected me to go for 45, 50 minutes if the spirit was there. And man, I, I, I had a, I had a, I, you know, it wasn't quite up to, to build Bill Johnson standards, but I, I did all right. And um, we walked out of that church uh, that night after worshiping, the gang members were there watching. Um, they were they were they were just standing there watching. Um, and it was that, at that first moment I felt that palpable fear uh, that the town felt. They couldn't name it; it was too dangerous to name it. But the gang was always watching. Uh, you could go into the safe place of fear, but then you had to step back out into the dangerous waters. Um, where people are being extorted and watched, um, and and you see. And in moments like that, how vital worship is, like how desperately vital worship is um, and why they're going to go to worship like five days a week um, because it's their experience of safety and forgiveness and prayer and hearing themselves uh, be called um, inheritors um, and children. Bearing witness, we said earlier uh, today, but bearing witness to that is as um as Paul says in Romans 8, bearing witness to the, the Holy Spirit of adoption that's adopting them into this, this family, calling them children. Um, that, was, that was really, really significant. So Sarah led the way and, and pulled me down, and then I could never escape gravity. Um, so I've really stayed in South Texas and, and further south, and it's hard, to, it's hard to make it above the Red River uh, for me these days. Yes, uh, uh, Debbie, you know, I grew up, Nick Brashear is one of my best friends of all times. Um, I remember sitting in Debbie's uh, kitchen uh, and feeling so at home. And then the, the upstairs, uh, they're just down the street from the church. Um, 
And at, at that time, it's just across the street from the Adams house. What a beautiful memory that is on top of that steep hill. Um, Debbie's asking if our services are still online. And yes, they are. I am a, I am a televangelist now. <laughs> I broadcast onto the, onto the, the, oh yeah. And then Sarah put the, um, put the Facebook uh, connection there. Are there any other thoughts or questions or, or pushbacks or, or interest in, uh, in, in other issues? I was just going to say, John, that as you were talking about the gangs, I think related back to what you talked about is every gang member I talked to had a history of extreme trauma in their background and were just looking for love and had not, didn't have love in their life. And one of the few like solutions to gang membership that people talked about in Central America was the church. So the very few gang members who, at least they are less so here, but who, who left gangs um, went to the church. Yeah, that's, that's a really important story. Uh, it's not one that we pick up a lot, I think, in our current media. Um, but the gangs are um, the gangs are idolatrous churches is what they are. They hold up the idolatry of power and money. Um, you know, some American churches do the same thing, uh, sadly, um, and with with similar effects. But but um, and, and what 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 the answer is, in fact, is is the um, uh, this pilgrim church. The pilgrim church is the answer to so, so much of these these horrific violences. Yeah. I wrote a question, but I'll just speak it out loud. Um, I'm convinced that there is so much unaddressed trauma personally and systemically in our churches. And I think part of the problem is not recognizing it. I'm thinking that some of it. And I think probably also not feeling equipped to know how to respond. Um, and of course, as you talked about your own experience as a people with a great deal of privilege, it's very hard sometimes to, to talk about uh, your own trauma. But uh, my own experience as a pastor was I was a guest preacher in a church and I uh, included in my sermon uh, a, just a brief touch on about trauma I had experienced. And at the end of the service, it was like I couldn't get away. Uh, and I spent 30 minutes just talking with one person who waited till the very end. So uh, th your thoughts on uh, how as a church, you've given us wonderful steps and um, ways to respond, but how do we go about identifying and responding? That's a, Susan, I love you. And I love that question. I love the way that you, you phrase that it is so vital. There's two things that first come to mind. The first huge danger is comparative trauma. We can never, ever, ever compare traumas. A trap is a trap. And you can drown in 50 feet of water at, um, is Lakeshore still a thing in Louisville? That, that old, that was the most terrifying place in my memory, <laughs> that, that massive pit of water. That's what it's called, Lakeshore, Lakeside. right? Lakeside. And then yeah, Lakeside, yes, thank you. I think Margaret Graves saved me from Lakeside. Um, still in my nightmares. You can drown in Lakeside. You can drown in a ditch that's two inches deep. And we as church members, as church leaders, need to be very clear with folks that um, uh, a trap is a trap. You can experience horrific trauma as an immigrant, the type of trauma that makes the news, or also, I mean, not to be flippant, losing your dog, like watching your precious dog die, like, and not, and not let, not releasing that, or also, not being loved, uh, reaching out for love and not receiving it at this really critical moment and never being able to, to release that. Um, trauma is trauma until it is transformed. Um, and, and I think that, that, that not letting people get caught up in comparative trauma. And we do that actively in prayer groups um, where as a church, you're regularly praying together. We do it daily. If you're doing it once a week, you need to let people say, 
I am really happy and grateful about this. And I'm real worried and hurt about this. And let's not compare it to anyone else's. Uh, so one person is, uh, and it's, you need to kind of have one person to kind of give permission uh, to be like, I am really hurt um, uh, by the fact that, that I didn't get a card uh, from my friend on my birthday something like that. You know, it's that lack of, and, and someone else at the same time is saying, uh, my, my child is dying. Um, and, and the, the trap is a trap because of the way it makes us act. Um, and that's the important thing. If we're caught in the trap, then we cannot love and we cannot receive love. Um, and so we need to provide that, that, um, uh, that, um, that opening, that open door, that welcome to, um, uh, any any sorts of any sorts of traps. So we can introduce the um, the 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 pathway to transformation to healing. Um, and the, the other thing is uh, we're real afraid of it because we think I don't want to talk about trauma because then people are going to talk to me about trauma uh, as it happened when he preached about it. Um, and and that is something that we as a church we just need to be real honest about what we are as Christians. We are a trauma transforming faith movement. Um, and if you, you can't really read scripture at all without reading about traumatized people, traumatized families, traumatized communities, and how God is leading their transformation. So if we're not talking about it, then we're, let's just not pretend to be church anymore. Let's just be a social club. Um, but let's, let's adopt fearlessly the language of trauma transformation um and unblinkingly listen no no i take that back we can cry along with people's stories but we don't need to be afraid um and we don't need to be afraid when people share really deeply traumatic stories um we just need to accompany and listen and create that experience of safety uh you are loved ah that makes me cry uh we're all crying together um, you know what, here in this place, you are absolutely safe. And then once we're in that place of safety, we as a church are going to start listening with you as that story is transformed from a story of victimization to a story of resilience, to a story of receiving um, survivorship or receiving resilience. Um, but that's a great question, Susan, and I, I, I love it. I could spend, I could spend more time uh, talking about that for sure. Um, just because that's that's kind of ecclesiology, um, I think, and certainly ecclesiology post pandemic um, in in America, y'all. The church in America is dying. The American church is dying, and most folks who read very much are being like, "Praise God," <laughs> because a new church is rising up, uh, and that new church is the church that's transforming trauma. Uh, we call it the Pilgrim Church that Alice is is mentioning. Uh, and that's just like a play on words from like so many of the main characters in scriptures are pilgrims, they're homeless. And the, the, the church of the New Testament is a homeless church, a traveling church, a pilgriming church, sojourning church, whatever the, however you want to translate the, the word. Um, and that, and essentially what that denotes is we're all on the way together. Um, we're all, we're all walking, um, we're all walking together home and we are home now, but it's not a full home. Um, and, and we're all, we're all sort of walking in the, in this healing journey. Um, not, not that we are the institution, but we're bearing witness to, uh, the spirit. So, uh, and then Jason, oh yeah, Jason, you were talking about the ADOS and reparations immigration policy. Um, and, you know, I think that that is, I, I, so I'll just say, I'll just uh, preface. So we have received a lot of, of uh, asylum seekers. Uh, these are folks who come to the United States and ask um, for, to receive asylum. I can talk more about immigration, may, probably in another time. It's a really heavy and dense topic. Um, but we get, we get asked these same, these same questions. We get attacked. Um, uh, I think on some of these, these same areas of, oh, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? It's always the same three questions, though. Um, it's always the same three questions. Um, is this legal? Is helping, or is helping these immigrants, is that, are you all breaking the law? My daughter, in fact, actually asked me, 12 years old, she's like, dad, are you a felon? 
um, you know, is this legal uh, that we're doing? Um, and then, and then the second question is always, um, it's the it's the economic question. Like, what do we have enough money to do this? Why? Oh, why should we take care of all of these people? Um, we don't have enough money to do this. You just kind of do the calculation in your head of like, how can we pay for all this hurt? And then the third question is a, is a change question. How will this change us? How will this change our society? How will this change our, our language? How will this change our healthcare system? How will it change our um, culture? How will it change our food? How will it change our worship service if we're going to let all these people in? Um, so it's all these, these change questions. It's always the same three fear-based questions. The way I respond to them uh, is always... I pretend to be like Jesus-like and be like, well, Jesus always had you know, hard questions asked to him. And he would always be like, good question. Here's a better question. Um, and, and you always want to respond to the question and be like, oh, that's a good question. That's a good, that's a good question about the law. That's a really good question about finances. That's a great question about change. It's a good, um, it's a good economic question. It's a, it's a responsible question. It's a good American question. It's not a Christian question. And I would like to ask Christian questions. So why don't you help me? Let's ask, why don't you, you and I together now, or let's all of us together now ask good Christian questions. I genuinely will lead in in that direction. Uh, whether you're talking about uh, race relations, wait, I mean, immigration, basically, let's be honest, it's just a racism issue. Um, it's not really anything much beyond that. Um, so, so our job is probably not to propose policy fixes, but what we do is we bear witness to who the policies affect. And we demand that people respond to good Christ-centered questions. Um, that's, I mean, that's really easy when you're talking about the financial question. Do we have enough? Um, I've calculated, and it's going to take a whole bunch of denarii to feed all of these people. In fact, we're going to have to work for an entire year to have enough denarii to feed all these people. I mean, that's right there in Mark chapter six and Mark chapter eight. Like it's right there. The disciples asked, it's an ancient 2000 year old question. Um, and there's wonderful Christian questions to get out. Well, let's look at what we have. How are we bringing it back to Jesus? How is Jesus taking that and multiplying it? How are we serving it? How are we then taking the time to recognize we're participating in a miracle by counting the baskets that are left over. Um, and, also, and also about the change question, I mean, God forbid we are those people who are trying to avoid change. Uh, Jesus was really into change. He was really into um, you know, letting that old self die, uh, letting that old America die, uh, even though it was pretty great, I guess, according to some people. Um, it's being transformed into the kingdom um here and now and and forevermore that's a long-winded answer i think about the ados um but i think it taps into this deeper uh discussion around racism uh being anti-racist um to be anti-racist means you're asking really good questions that demand are coupled with action um also the other thing we talk about is john the first chapter of john you get the first racist comment in the gospel um where someone is like someone is like no good thing comes from that place. No good person comes from that place. And he's talking about Jesus. It's like this racist comment around Jesus. And Philip's answer there is not a political answer. It's not an economic answer. It's not a sociological answer. It's a come and see. Uh, it's an invitation. Um, and we as a church participate in anti-racism. And all we say to the community is like, we're asking better questions. Come and see. Uh, we're listening to better answers. Come and see. Um, and it's that it's that invitation to participation in what what we call you know large large vocabulary hesed, um, or in this case the Messiah. You know, come and see what what the Messiah is. Pat, you asked Sarah. No, your mother spent much time listening to trauma, addressing trauma. <laughs> yes, her, her example influenced me. Yeah, I uh, I'm looking at her picture right now. And I keep her handwriting all over the place, uh, just to remind me. Uh, I keep one of her prayers that it was tucked into her Bible that I took. I, it's right next to my desk. Um, and, you know, I see her little edits to it, her little handwriting, uh, her list. 
you just hear that voice. My mother was not a saint. None of us are saints, except we are, uh, because saint is Kodesh. Saint just means you belong to God. We ain't perfect. None of us are perfect, um, but we belong to God. And that's the way I think mom, mom took it on, took life on. She's like, we may, may, may not be perfect. Families aren't perfect. Families are flawed, but they belong to God. Churches aren't perfect, but they belong to God. We um, belong to God. We're Kodesh, which means a saint. That's why pa Paul called all the churches saints, even though they're all messed up. Uh, he was just reminding them, y'all, you belong uh, to God. Um, and John, uh, you wrote, power at the end of 23rd Psalm, goodness, result of our good actions, mercy, forgiveness of our mistakes and screw ups, but we're with God, whatever. Um, yeah, you bet. I, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm working it with in the Psalms in terms of sets and how they were organized into sets. Um, but, but Psalm 22 and 23 are one of those, like, here's a summary of it all. Um, you get, you get really the key characters that you find in all the other Psalms. You got the enemy, you got the liar, um, you've got the pit, um, and you also have the Hesed love, you have the steadfastness, you have the righteousness, and you have the home, the presence of God. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good comment. Anything else someone, someone wants to bring up or ask more specifically about um, or push back on or, or get a clarification on or another comment you were hoping to hear more about? Hey, John. Hi, yeah, thank, thank you for, for sharing. Um, uh, you're, you're a good looking televangelist, first of all. Um, <laughs> uh, and thank you for all the work you've been doing. Um, you know, maybe not now, but I, I'd love at a future point to hear more about some of your interactions with folks affiliated with the ADOS movement. Uh, one interesting, I think, development that's happened at, at Crescent Hill is via relationship that we have um, with some Black Baptist church leaders here in Louisville, um, a lot of us have increasingly um, grown uh, very much aware of, of, of that particular push. Uh, and certainly Louisville, uh, I think, has become kind of a, an epicenter of, of uh, that movement and um, the reparations conversation. So, um, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, perhaps down the road, when we get you to Crescent Hill to preach, uh, we, we can uh, talk talk more about that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I, I love hearing the stories of of Louisville and following you, Jason, and 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 um and the way you're leading the church, and then also kind of uh, walking up ahead and 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 yanking people along, and then also uh, walking with people. I mean, isn't the New Testament just all about race relations? I mean, there's so much of it, which is about, um, let me be honest. Let me be real honest. It's about revulsion. Um, it's about real legitimate anger and revulsion. When they were sitting, when the Jews were sitting down to the table uh, with Gentiles, the Gentiles stunk and they were eating nasty foods, like make you want to vomit foods. Um, and it was culturally impossible what they did. Um, and you think about what we're doing in America and the, it, the cultural impossibility. We're on the other side of it, though. We, as in like, I'm looking at my sister and I, us with white skin. We are the revolting ones just because of where we came from and what we've, what we've inherited. And, and then, and then, uh, uh, you know, thanks be to God for the Holy Spirit that moves through this revulsion. Uh, but it's it's play, it's setting it puts you down in this really really humble place of not only listening and weeping, but also this humble place of powerlessness. Uh, but like this is not something we fix. This is something we participate in the fixing of. This is something we watch and then walk along with. Um, which is, uh, I think, a shaking, a rattling thing for the institutional church uh, to, to, to grapple with. Um, but then also we, get, we can follow along Paul's letters and see um, how that was, that was taking shape on the margins of the empire um, 2,000 years ago. Um, that was, that's, that, that's a, I, I mean, I think there's, a, there's some really 
uh, interesting directions to go with the church there, especially with this understanding of trauma um, and uh, understand how to react to trauma in, in loving ways, um, for sure. But Bill, did you want to add something there? Um, no, I, there was a comment by Tom Leitze that um, I don't know if you want to respond to. And then Kay Sanders um, has, uh, has asked whether or not you're going to write a book. So... <laughs> Um, I'll talk to my sister about writing a book. Um, she's, she's the writer. You know what I did one time? I did write a pretty good article. Uh, and the only reason it was good is I gave it to my sister and she made it a good article. <laughs> and they, they published it in, uh, in Christianity Today. Uh, I read, um, uh, but she, she's the writer. Um, but thank you for that, Kay. Um, we're, we're working on some... Well, you know, I'm actually working on some stuff with a Hebrew scholar, um, it, just in terms of Guide, guidance for churches who are doing trauma healing work using um, using the ancient scriptures. Um, and, and Thomas wrote about my mom's work, Inside Out Families, the Thick Family Ministry Handbook. Um, oh, by the way, uh, it's really interesting that, that Bill earlier talked about these thin places. Um, and so these, these, these thick texts um, and, and thick guidance and the thick texts lead us into being thin people. Uh, letting in the spirit of God, letting in the movement of God. We don't want to be, we, as a church, we want to read thick stuff, but we want to be thin churches, <laughs> if that, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm grateful for you for it, since you both appear in it. There's some pretty good stories. I think the stories about me are a little more embarrassing than the ones about Sarah. I think, let's be honest, in some of those books. My daughters have enjoyed reading some of those stories about me um, being, being goofy. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sarah. Any other comments or questions? We're kind of getting down to that. Here in Texas, it's just four o'clock, but I, I think it's about five o'clock there in, in Louisville. Well, I don't see any, anyone else um, waving their hand or um, seeming to want to say anything. So let me end this by thanking uh, John, you and Sarah for uh, uh, really inspiring uh, and enlightening um, two hours together, three hours. Um, we're very grateful that you accepted our invitation. We're very grateful that we thought to invite you. And um, so it, it's been just a really wonderful experience. Uh, the lectures will be on uh, recorded. We've recorded them and they will be available from the church website in case you want to um, review them again. Um, and I, I don't know how long we keep those things up, but um, uh, maybe we can keep this up in, per, in perpetuity. Um, I also want to thank a couple of people uh, who were behind the scenes helping with the technical aspects of this. Um, Andrea Woolley, um, one of our co-pastors uh, set up the Zoom account that allowed us to do this. And um, uh, both Eileen Bartlett and Kelly Wogan have been in another room here at church, making sure that we didn't goof it up too much in this room. So uh, we are grateful that you could be with us and um, uh, we wish all of you the best. So um, we can go now and I think we go with grace and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you all. This is like a life honor for Sarah and I, I think, to see all these faces gathered around. We'll head back, we'll head back to Louisville when, when, uh, when things are a little nicer. We'll see you soon. Love y'all. Love you. Bye. Do you have that prayer of your mom's? Uh, yes, I do. In fact, I put it up on Facebook. Uh,